meeting and the open meeting of the East Ham uh, zoning task force. It is October 15th. It's 4 o'clock p.m. The meeting is a hybrid meeting, uh, both in person and on Zoom. The meeting is being recorded and will be available on the town's website at www.eastham-ma.gov. Thank you. And we do have a form. Thank you. Voice of the task force. No. <laughs> well, I saw her so eloquently do that in front of the select board last week. I thought, oh, <laughs> we got to do this quick. Uh, Carolyn, by any chance, did you have minutes for last week's I meeting? I okay. I sent them out, but I also have uh, Co a copy. I copy that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have another one? Thank you. I don't have any more paperwork. I, I don't have another no, one. No, that's fine. But you can have this one. Yeah. one. Oh, I have this one. I was looking for like last month's. This is September. I just sent this one out. This is September. It says May. Oh, okay. I got it. Oh, so I uh, propose the minutes of the September 17th. 2024 meeting, um, which uh, I just handed out if you take a minute to read. Oh, there were, there yeah. Were yeah, I didn't read the whole sentence. Oh, yeah. Did you want to guess on Paul or just no? No, no. okay. Yeah. All right, do I um. Have people had a chance to look at we yep. approved the minutes of the September 17th, 2024 meeting. Second. I'll second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. Let me give you, um, let me just do some introductory comments and then we can jump into this. Um, I'm delighted we have Sarah here today because. Um, uh, as you know from the process, um, we will have a process that uh, goes through a variety of public forums and then the planning board, conservation board, board of health, and then, then we will have an important approval process with the Cape Cod Commission prior to us going to the select board for the final, uh, final uh, vote for inclusion in the town warrant. Um, Obviously, given that schedule, we will be jammed up uh, in March with votes, et cetera. And uh, it's been helpful to have Sarah participate in this for many reasons, um, the, just the insights and the um, information that she's been able to present from the um, commission. Um, but we also want to um, understand the commission's perspective. I don't, you know, I'd like us to see if we can work through most of the issues we have prior to us getting to that 11th hour. So uh, we will talk about some of the uh, question, comments or concerns that uh, commission staff had uh, as our first agenda item. Um, another agenda item, which you don't have before you, but we will have to address, uh, is that the ADU uh, bylaw, which we updated um, a couple of years back and was approved by town meeting, uh, that uh, has been superseded by the new um, Housing Act that was uh, approved by the state. There's some um, conflicts between our language and that ADU language, so it will need us to go back to reconcile those um, just to clear up any confusion because the state interpretations will prevail. Um, and we're going to do that at a next meeting. Uh, we've asked our, uh, Paul has asked the town council, Carolyn Murray, to do a draft of what would be the changes necessary to bring us into compliance. There's some, as there always is, some gray areas. <laughs> There's some things open to interpretation. And so we may be in a situation where uh, we might have a revised draft, but they're anticipating sometime December, January, February-ish, 
that the state is going to have more specific gu guidance come out that has not come out yet. So we may get more um, before before anywhere before this has to get near a warrant, we may have more uh, information available. But that would just be a cleanup that was not on our agenda, but um, that would need to be um, addressed. Um, I also want to bring up just an issue that um, uh, Paul raised with me about a week or so ago uh, as we were incorporating after the last meeting all of the uh, comments and questions and the outstanding questions and looking at uh, the zoning bylaw itself. Um, it was, quite frankly, kind of a bear. <laughs> It's it, it's we've taken a lot of things out of that draft master plan that master document and put them in the design regulations. Um, but it may call for some more movement uh, because we have almost a hundred page zoning document and it's and and there are certain things like performance standards and some other elements that that Paul has identified that could move to the design guidelines. So um, he didn't have time for this meeting and we didn't have time on the agenda, but I'd like us to um, have that as a topic for a meeting and have Paul come back with some with a mocked up version, which suggests some things go to the other document, um, just as a way of simplifying things. Um, the other things that we still have outstanding is um, Carolyn is going to give us by the end of Carolyn Murray, the town council is going to give us uh, more instruction. Um, we've asked certain questions about the integration of the other zoning bylaws in the town and how they impact the DCPC uh, inclusionary zoning and other things of that nature. And uh, it, it's not directly in conflict, but sometimes the language is ambiguous. So she wants us, or she's going to give us some instruction for what we might need to do with the main bylaw to integrate those things. So um, we're waiting for that from her, um, we hope by Friday. And so if we come back to look at things we need to take out to simplify, put in design guidelines and some corrective language, we will have that there, as well as just a couple of things we haven't We've done a little more research. I talked to a lawyer in another town. I'm gonna to do a follow-up call with him this week about the whole concept of peer review. This was the notion of when you had a really, we've been thinking about this as a big project um, that has you know, the full-blown development proposal where there's parties involved and uh, multiple buildings and lots of you know, issues with architecture and engineering, et cetera. Um, it is a practice in some towns to uh, require a peer review, um, which is basically uh, applicants would actually pay for this. It, it sort of, it gives the town a second opinion. It, it brings an architectural engineering firm in here and they do an assessment of the, the proposals that are being put forth. Um, as opposed to relying exclusively on town staff to be able to um, and do all of the interpretation. So we're still looking for good language for that, um, as well as um, the formula businesses. We have language. Um, I would say it's somewhat soft and at times a little ambiguous. We've looked at Provincetown, Concord, um, Wellfleet, Situate, um, maybe one other town. We're trying to look at language in that formula business because obviously we want to de-incentivize formula businesses. Um, we've talked about the P-Town experience uh, with their new franchise. They have down there Lazy Lobster, which was really quite interesting, but <laughs> we won't go into that. So there's a few pieces of ketchup. So with that, I'm going to conclude, but one of the things, <laughs> I, I, some of you may not be surprised, I'm not sure how we're going to get this all done in one more meeting after this. I'm not suggesting weekly meetings, but let's get through this. And at the end of this meeting, uh, I'm thinking there may be one additional meeting. And maybe it's not tacked on to the next, maybe it's before the next meeting, 
we I know we have some scheduling issues, so it may not have to be at this day or this time. But um, I'm just I'm starting to feel like we're running out of time. Um, so that's my Paul. Did I miss anything in the broad over introduction of what's outstanding? No, I think yeah. I guess the only thing I'd say is um, like Mary was saying, I, we've been going through these bylaws. So we have two documents. We have the document that is going to be incorporated in the zoning bylaw that we've been working through. And then we have this other document, which is the planning board design guidelines and they're work in tandem. But what we are trying to do is strengthen the guidelines. So they're not really guidelines. They're um, actually regulation, planning board design regulations. And we want that to be a really solid document that basically it needs to be, um, taken into account. So it's not just like, yeah, try and do the guidelines. So we have we have some language in the bylaw with some teeth in it that says, refer to these regulations, so you have to do it. The, the reason for breaking it up is kind of two things. One, to put everything that we would want to incorporate into the form-based code into the bylaw would make the bylaw, in my opinion, very unwieldy, a very long section and so there's just a logistical thing, and I'll come back to that in a second. The other part is just planning board design guidelines or design regulations can be amended um, as needed without having to go to town meeting. So they can be done through a public hearing process, but with the planning board. So to me, the content of the design guidelines is important, but a lot of it, in my opinion, is stuff that you probably want to be able to have more flexibility to change because that's where we're going to, when we go through the document, that's where it's going to be like outdoor amenity spaces. Like, here's your menu of things. Like, you need to provide some sort of it. Here's your menu of the types of things you could do, you know, outdoor, you know, open space, public park versus a public garden versus a courted, cottage course, you know, all that stuff. And there may be things that come in and out of vogue that you want to be able to update on a more, you know, on an easier basis. So there's kind of like, those are the two basic <clears throat> things to keep in mind with why we have broken up all this content into two documents. Um, the other part of this is, as I was looking at all the content we have is, you know, we're trying to, zoning and right, land use regs are not cookie cutter. And I think everything that we've been talking about has merit in itself, you know, all of the content. But then you got to get down to what what is right for East Ham as far as the community and what we're trying to do with land use policy. But then also what is going to pass at town meeting and get acceptance from the community. So and I talked to Mayor about this. So, you know, we're getting near the end. And I just kind of was looking at all this saying, like, is this it's not that anything that we're talking about is, is bad. It's all kind of good best practices, so to speak, but is it really all necessary for East Ham? You know, and I, and I'll tell you just, you know, <clears throat> when someone goes to town meeting and we start having these workshops, you know, I just, I don't want to be overwhelming the community with like so much regulation that really may seem not right size for East End, you know, yeah. we got to just, so I have to be cognizant of, of that too. So that's what led to our discussion about, is there's, you know, is everything that we're working on really essential? Because we have a good core bylaw now, but the goal was always to incorporate the best pieces of the form-based code to make it less ambiguous where it need to be and just strengthen things where we felt and, and then some opportunities where we thought we could just make it more straightforward. So, and that and this will also get into, you know, comments we've heard back from the commission so far. So, I guess that's my thinking: is that how do we simplify this document to make sure that at its core, it's as we're getting the things that we absolutely think need to be in there, and that is appropriate for East Ham. And to be frank about it, I just started looking through a lot of stuff, and I'm like, this is good, but do we need this level of detail for East Ham? Do we need to do to the nth degree for East Ham, you know, and it's a dump, it's a catch 22 because like without the nature of the form based code is it's supposed to be detailed. That's the hard work that goes into it. It's supposed to be, you know, very prescribed. So then there's less ambig ambiguity. 
build it like this and you won't have any problems, but then it's just feel like, you know, is it too much? So that's what we wanted to get into some discussion about, you know, what should be in the bylaw, what maybe can be in the um, planning board regulations and like what's not needed at all. And maybe in the future we add things back in, but it's just, I'm just very cognizant of what can we get done in the time left to us and what's actually going to be able to be expressed and explained to the public between now and May and what is going to be. I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to town meeting in May with this huge document that no one really fully understands because we we're tinkering with it to the 11th hour, myself included. And then we start getting the question, like, what does all this mean? And it's just too much. And then people, you know, have a tendency, have a tendency to push back, push back, or just if in doubt, we know what we got. So let's not, and I don't, you know, I, you know, they tend not to vote for something that they don't fully understand. That's just their human nature. And I'd rather minimize that if possible. So that's kind of stuff that's been swirling around in my head. And I talked to Mary about that. So that's kind of where we are at this point. And we need to remember that right now in our bylaw, when we get to design, it says, um, we aspire to a traditional New England village. See Cape Cod Commission guidelines for advice. That That's it. <laughs> that's the, We're going from that <laughs> to like a hundred page document. <laughs> so. But what we tried to do, <laughs> sorry, what we tried to do yeah. is go into those mission yeah. guidelines yeah. and what Ted was providing to us and blend that. So it's just what is yeah. what is the right amount of content that should be in the bylaw so it's got the teeth in there and again what can be in the regs. But again, a big piece is we don't want this guideline. The language we have, like Mary said, is very soft. It's and the planning boards had, you know, some trouble really enforcing that because it is really like, well, go in that guideline and see what you can. It's like we want these planning board regs to be tandem with the bylaw. So it's like you cannot get the approvals unless you go have gone in and demonstrated you've gone into these planning board regs and pulled in what's pertinent and demonstrated that you're incorporating that into it. So it's strengthening the other document. Just a, a couple comments. <clears throat> um, I I already think I would agree with you, Mary and, and Paul, that I think we need a, another meeting. We're, we're just not going to get it all done, whether that's yeah. November, December, January, I'll leave it to you. But I would say, let's go ahead and just make that decision now and go ahead and get it on the books because November, December start to fill up pretty quick. Um, and part of that can be that last look at um, in the bylaw, in the regulations, hold for, for another time. You know, once we have everything that we think we want, then to Paul and Mary's point to yeah. simplify, one last pass through to do that. I think it's also been really important to sell and explain to the community and the planning board and the zoning board and the health board, all the other boards, comms, that, 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 that the, the vision of what we're trying to create, it, it, and it's a twofold vision. It's, it's what is the Northeastern vision to what is it going to look like at some point 20 years, 30 years from now. It's not going to happen overnight, but what's it going to look like? And, and have people see the vision. If they just start to read the details, you, you get so lost so quickly. So I think figuring out how to sell that vision first, and then this whole concept of the two separate documents, being sure that the planning board, the zoning board, et cetera, really understand the purpose of the two the teeth that they're the most supposed to have and get comfortable with that as we go into the town meeting and, and the discussion of what goes where. So I, I think that's part of the work that collectively we have in January after we get everything in, in some good shape or form. And I, I appreciate that you're taking the time to think about that yeah. because that will be, we've seen with some of our past zoning work that people generally understand what we're doing and generally agree with what the proposals are. And, and so at town meeting, it doesn't engender too much discussion. This is the same kind of process and that's probably going to happen again, as long as there's nothing that stands out or sticks out that, you know, like the diameter of trees. 
Yeah, it's a hundred page document. The number of people that are going to read this document before town meeting is right, but there, but there will be people, and and that's what we want. Oh, but you're but you're susceptible to exactly what you said. Somebody's right. going to say, "Oh, well, I have this tree in my front yard." Right, exactly, and that's you. Know, we can't the one off kind of things like that. We can't help, but but selling the vision, the twofold yeah. vision of yeah. how we're constructing all of this, and then what's the vision for Northeast? And this is what you know. It, it's part of the master plan. It's part of the house yeah. production plan. It's it's part of you know, other parts of strategic yeah. plan of, of the town. So anyway, that's, so I think we'll go ahead and schedule the fourth meeting. Then. Okay, any other comments or? I just, when I was looking through everything, I was wondering if there was a way to have some sort of summary documents so that people who, people who hear about East Ham, they don't, they don't need all that underpinning that someone on the planning yeah. board would really need to know. And so is there some way to have something that's almost like a summary and, and that says, and here's the goal, like this underpinning yeah. will lead to this. I so, just and that's some good. yeah, that's a good point. It actually segues into the discussion about the, the commission um review, but all of this work for this piece of the zoning bylaw is within is under the another piece of um, regulatory framework called the district of critical planning Center, right. which was put in several years ago and that's under the aegis of the cape cod commission and so we have kind of two levels we have our local zoning approval and town local town meeting process but all of this also has to be uh, reviewed and approved by the Cape Cod Commission. This is why Sarah's input is so vital and it's been so helpful. Be and so in the bylaw, it there is a whole um, you know purpose and intent of why we did the district. And so everything we're doing here, we have to remember that ultimately all these changes have to be in line with the goal and the purpose and the intent of why we created this district. And so that's where there's a lot of like cross-checking about yeah, this might be good and it, you know, it might be good in a vacuum, whatever this piece is, but is it actually mm -hmm. in line with what we're yeah. what, what, right. what it was? And so I um to your point, Pat, I think we will need to be able to convey that to the commission and and to the general public. And you know, our approach has been to do like a nice summary report you know in the past years we've done that and i think that document we'll plan to do that again but if we set this up correctly that'll be the document we can also use to bring to the commission to basically go through you know there's going to be a review of all the fine details but ultimately the commission itself not just the staff but the commission is another regulatory board which they're not going to be in the weeds on east you know, but we need to be able to provide an explanation of what we've done and why we think it does adhere to the overall intent and purpose of yeah. the district and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's going to be an important tool for multiple reasons we can use it to sell this whole thing and justify. So j just to follow up, like on both you and Carolyn, I agree we need a meeting and we wanted to do a report. Um, just just looking at the calendar, I had hoped that we could maybe get another meeting in in November. And the, the rationale being, I wanted to try to leave from Thanksgiving to the 1st of January as report writing time. Um, and what Martin, what we've done in the past is we haven't met every week. What we've done is circulated the report. People have given comments. I mean, it's it's mostly editing. I mean, we, you know, we're not breaking new ground with the report, but we're just doing the presentation. Um, Paul has... Um, Peter Flicker, who's um, you know has worked in tandem with Ted, and he's worked a bit with Jackie on this sort of visioning for new roadways. He's done he's doing a lot of mapping, so I'm really hoping that we can get a lot of this mapped out so that when we go, whether it's on a map or you know a projected on the screen, we can show the districts. We could show, you know, we can show highlight things whether it's boundary changes or whatever else is being proposed along with the report. Um, the, the reason why I wanted to get the report, hopefully in, you know, kind of almost final, final shape by January 1 is 
uh, as we talked about last week, we thought about having a sort of a, a very long three or four hour workshop, potentially that would include the select board, planning board, ZBA, and other regulatory boards that would be impacted in conservation, health, and maybe open space and strategic planning. I don't know. We, you know, we could think about the universe and really try to have a session where we drill down with those folks. Um, we want to have at least one, if not more, community forums where we do something at the library where we're talking to the public in general. And then we're going to have three public, three mandated, mandated public hearings. <laughs> and then we've got to get planning board approval and then get to a presentation for the Cape Cod Commission. It sounds like we have a lot of time, but I'm thinking we've got to do the, all of those hearings pretty much in January and February and enter March with you know, being in the commission and then back to the select board, just, just logistically. And, you know, assuming that people, you know, every year we've gone out with this, whether it's the select board or we've heard something from the public, we have made changes and we've had to have quick phone calls to say, we're hearing this. What do you think? You know, should we make a recommendation differently? So that's kind of what I'm thinking of. So, so yes, November. So November. Okay. Uh, we don't have to put, let, let's get to the substance. And before we leave, we're going to pull out calendars and just talk through some dates. Sarah, we shared with the committee um, an excerpt of the comments that you, you made. And so I'm, I'm not to try to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would it be helpful for you to sort of lead through and interpret, sort of give us a sense of where you and the commission staff are coming with some of these comments so that we can kind of either have a dialogue or just thought if we have to think through. Sure. So um, I guess I think probably the easiest thing for me to do is to summarize what I consider the highlights. Okay. Uh, and, and maybe there's three. Uh, the first being the uh, sort of a response to the town's ideas about changing the designation of some of the areas within the special corridor district. And, and so there were a number of spots where you're talking about, uh, essentially, I'm gonna call it upzoning, you know, allowing a greater amount of commercial development in an area um, than is allowed today. And I think some of those locations you had a good justification for, and I'll throw out the, the obvious one is uh, the large um, tea time par parcel, but I didn't, or we didn't really see such a clear justification for some of the other locations. And um, I think in particular, as it relates to traffic around Route 6 and sort of the Bracket Road, Route 6 intersection and area there that we felt that it would, uh, be a lot easier if you had a, a clear justification for that. Um, and, and I think in my comments, I even asked, like, do you know what people are, what you want to see in that area or what developers are proposing to sort of help determine whether increasing the development potential in those areas really makes sense. Um, so that's one. Um, two uh, is related, the whole issue of traffic safety in general. Uh, one of the big, or one of the important elements of your existing zoning was limits on new access points to Route 6 and also limits on the size of access points that exist on Route 6. Um, and that seemed to disappear with the reorganization of, of the bylaw. And that's something that we think is very important to somehow incorporate back in there that we had identified some areas that uh, essentially any place that had frontage on both Route 6 and a secondary road, that they should only be allowed access on the secondary road. Uh, any place that had access on Route 6, you know, should be limited to one access point if, they, if that's all they have now, or if they don't have any now. Uh, and then, uh, you know, along with that, there might be incentives to reduce the number of access points. And that's all in the name of you know traffic flow and traffic safety really through the district. Um, and I think the what I would consider the other main issue is um, sort of the simplicity of 
the dimensional regulations and the dimensional regulations table. Uh, maybe I should say the dimensional table and the use table sort of running parallel to each other that uh, we've seen and it sort of a movement towards simplifying use tables. And I shared an example from downtown Hyannis, which is probably the most complicated, uh, used to be one of the most complicated zoning districts on the Cape, but they've now simplified their use table to like a dozen different uses and um, hasn't been in place for terribly long. But um, I think that it, it could be to your benefit to keep the use table simple um, in terms of the fact that, you know, there always will be new types of uses that come around. And if they're not explicitly stated in your use table, you may run into problems. Um, so that, and then the dimensional table, this is really in my mind where you define the size and the scale of the buildings you want and you, and it, you differentiate between the different parts of the special uh, Eastern Porter special district that you have larger and more densely developed properties in the core than you have in the other areas of the district. And to be able to um, illustrate that kind of easily in one concise table, I think would be really helpful in terms of ease of understanding for everyone. I think it would also help you a lot when it comes to explaining it to the public and justifying it. Um, so I would encourage you to try to find a way to pick perhaps the most important parts of the dimensional regulations, put them back into one table, and then maybe there are secondary tables that go along with that. So there were other items in my comments uh, or in our comments, but I'm gonna say those were the the most important. But I completely agree with all your ideas about simplifying the document, mm -hmm. moving as much as possible into your design regulations document so that it can be adapted more easily. And I'd be happy, to, obviously, to answer any other specific questions. If you... um, can I just ask one that um... If we did it, I don't know if we did it intentionally. I don't, I didn't see where we had altered the driveway uh, access, routes. access routes in any way. Well, so what happened was, uh, so the dimensional table that's in place today has uh, a, a line that talks about, depending on what district you're in, and how you access route six. And that information is repeated in the special permit process narrative. And I think what happened was in Ted's rewriting that both of those were, were okay. changed. And so it was lost sort of in translation. I think we did, um, yeah, that's right. And that was unintentional. Um, okay, so that's- In the dimensional table, there's a there's a row that talks about Route Six access and basically limits the width of curb cuts and only so that that is intended that, to be that just inadvertently got so that, chopped so, off so that so that's inadvertently so we we dropped some language which we didn't yeah. intend to drop so that that yeah. could maybe that's yeah that'll be that'll be that included. should be an yeah. easy fix yeah, yeah. okay um let's let's talk about the boundary issues um so. You know, some of the boundary changes were changing the tea time site to transitional because we realized it was in limited and it was not going to support the development, any magnitude of development that was really intended for tea time. So we had made that adjustment, and I think the commission is is agreeing with that. Um, now, one, I think they've raised traffic and safety concerns about we we sort of said let's expand the um core commercial to include the two commercial properties on the other side of route six the Nickerson, Nickerson garage and the shell station and to be honest i don't think we did any in-depth analysis other than we thought if we could 
bring those in, it would make it more cohesive with what is opposite. And the shell station is a shell station. I, we have no information that they plan on changing anything there. Nickerson Garage at some point will be redeveloped. Um, the current family has not made any decisions about how it would be redeveloped. Um, and I know there's been some interest Paul has heard from some retail operators. And again, the theory there was simply to have the standards that were being in place on the other side of the street um, brought over. It's, it's a small, quite frankly, it's a small lot. So the amount of development is not gonna be substantial. Um, so that's one. I, I, Mary, it's up behind you. We're just talking about the two lots, 45, 45 15, 45. and 45, 65. Yeah. yeah. Not, not that lot 20, but the one that's on the Yeah, just, just, yeah, this is Nickerson. Gas stations, the, uh, the Nickerson garage and then the shell station. Yeah. And I, the, and I think. The vacant, the vacant garage, we should say. Yeah. The vacant so, garage. that's going to get to be developed. That, that'll get redeveloped. And I think part of that, from my perspective too, is just, it just seemed like you got core commercial on one side. The other side in the in the yellow is office residential, and there's just like a real lopsided difference between what you can do in office residential versus core commercial. The office residential is the least uh, intense, and for those two lots on Route Six, we're just in my mind just trying to find a balance so that if things if these things get all redeveloped, at least you got some cohesiveness on both sides. And just the reality of what those two could be used for. And now maybe it's maybe it's core commercial on both sides. Maybe it's transition commercial if there's uh, an appreciable difference there that that mitigates it. But that to me, it would just seemed like it was a little bit lopsided, where you're directly across the street from the core commercial, but you're so and on Route Six, but you're very much limited in what you could do. So it was really trying to even that out just so that you know this, the, the danger is that we're diluting that if three let's say three or four businesses get redeveloped on Nixon's that's three or four businesses that you're not going to get across the street on off of Friday. Because we all agree there's only so many restaurants and business opportunities that are going to happen. Yeah. Well I mean and uh, Sarah I'm interpreting your the commission's comments here is that you were concerned about the traffic generation that, that might have I mean, I don't think the gas station is the gas station, but Nickerson and the one on the corner. Well, traffic generation is a piece of it. It's also the issue of, of uh, you know, it's the issue of of dilution too, which which we mentioned. But it's the question of whether having poor commercial on both sides of Four Lane Highway really makes sense because a core is kind of a walkable area. And so you can imagine people walking back and forth over Bracket Road and through all of these connected properties on the east side. But do you actually imagine people, you know, crossing Route 6 to pedestrian, you know, and pedestrian friendly developments on the other side of the road? Or is that different? Is it is it more of a we're setting everything up for people to Park your car, spend the day, walk around, do some shopping, find something to eat. And if you've done all that, and then you're like, oh, we want to eat over there across the street, the taco place. Now yeah. you have pedestrians crossing Route 6. Okay. Yeah. So, but I understand what you're saying. And I understand there's obviously, you know, there's existing commercial uses there or, you know, um, the rights for existing commercial uses. And, um, and and I should say that the commission isn't going to say um, that you know that they're not we're not going to disagree with something as long as the town justifies it. Uh, at least that's my opinion. But I I think it might be worth being more cautious to begin with mm -hmm. and and save some of the ideas about increasing development potential outside of the core. For a little bit further down the line, when you've had some success in making things happen in the board. Any other comments on this particular parcel or concept? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I guess I kind of 
kind of lean towards thinking what Sarah just said, which is leave it as it is now. That could be mm -hmm. two years from now. And it's a tough thing. It's it's such a blight that we have the tendency to say we have ten. I have a tendency yeah. to say let's incent let's incent them to develop it because it is a blight right on right, right on. You don't like the artwork. Or? <laughs> I don't think I do not dislike that work. That's not that's not what I view as a blight. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um but it also has to do with uh route six and six improvements and traffic plan and, and the whole idea of pedestrians crossing route six. Yeah, I mean we get a core commercial down here. Pedestrians pedestrians now cross route six on bicycles all the time. Right. So I mean it, we will any any development down here is gonna bump into that reality yeah i don't i this was different than yeah than setting something up that we yeah. want to attract yeah. people to yeah. move back and forth and across your six i don't know if that's addressed in the group six improvement plan at this point the pedestrian crossing at bracket road over group six yeah i mean there would be there would be improvements but i mean it is going to be it is what highway. it is I mean, yeah that's right you can't yeah can't design our way totally out of that reality. So. so this is the one I didn't think folks would feel really strongly about. I think if we get down the other end of bracket, Sarah, one of our other notions is taking these two orange parcels. They're all the three orange parcels. They're all um, commercial developments right now, and really expanding it down there because making them part of the core. making them part of the core because that would. You know, we'd like it as you know things happen. They move up to the front. You know, mm -hmm. if, if we incent if if the core commercials is happens as we envision it, it might incentivize development down there. Mm -hmm. um, so, is that is that? A, I mean, it's all commercial right now. Yeah, I think that's a lot easier justification. I mean, for the reasons you just gave, yeah. and the fact that it's on Bracket Road, which we already yeah. acknowledge can be pedestrian friendly and. Yeah. That it's uh, it's a secondary road to Route Six, so you're not talking about people act, uh, entering and exiting. Route sure, six. and hopefully we have a secondary road that's going to be supporting that at some point, the Homes Road. And then the final one, Paul, do you want to get down to just past tea time? Chocolate cafe. Chocolate cafe. So. Ooh, it's pretty cool. Where's that green coming from? Is that the National Seashore? Oh, that's, yeah, that's the, that's the other zoning district. Oh, that's the water district? You're really talking about, oh, I can't highlight this one. And this is Poits, and then. That's the biking? Biking shore is the So, I so, so this, actually, it's the kind of this whole, Area here. Well, just just the frontage just, on route, yeah, just the just, frontage on Route Six. So. Just Route Six. Just Route Six. So you don't want to go all the way back. Just, so it's really kind of like. So. These. Before we did the DCPC, these were, in a, residential a mixed use residential commercial zone, and obviously they have, commercial properties. We down zone them into residential because the thought was we do want things to be concentrated within you know the DC, you know, within the commercial districts. Over the intervening years just come up with just what is but what is left available to these properties and these businesses or what they what can they do if they you know if if they wanted to res, revert to residential then that's great and that would fit in but just keep coming up to this with our discussions with some of the owners and you know they want to keep the business open and they want to be able to adapt to their business models and things so that's why we got to this point of re we want to reconsider what's the merit of putting these back into a commercial zone where we could accommodate that residential is always going to be allowed if they won't convert it but what if they don't that's kind of like um, and we had discussions with the Viking Shores owner. I think that, I think that probably has changed hands now. But um, oh, no, a second time. 
another time? Oh, sold two years ago. Yeah, I'm not sure. I forget. I don't know. But we, we did talk with the owner. I don't know if it's the current owner, but um, I, I think, you know, mixed use in the residential component is always going to be there. And I know some of these folks want to add that component into it, which works, but it's just, what if they don't? I guess that's... Well, that's I mean, the whole strip is... We only did, we were only looking at the frontage on Route 6 and just that one side. And everything on that frontage right now has a commercial property from Hoyts to Biking Shores, Hopper Real Estate. Um, you've got a, a chocolate cafe, you've got the brick uh, brick house, you've got Bob's subs, Leatherworks, Leatherworks Ponder. Right the... No, so it would go, it's really just to be specific, it's the chocolate cafe, the Next door is a residential, but it has been uh, commercial in the past. And then we have a house. Then there's the um, leather shop, Hop Realty, Viking Shores, and Points. Just the item. Oh, just... no, you've got those three houses in the triangle. The house that just got renovated. Yeah, we. That yeah, wasn't the intent. Yeah, I, oh, that was that's, this is just this, okay. yeah. just the we, ones on the, the one we the, what we had proposed was just the frontage of those six or seven commercial properties. Again, we had heard from the maybe the the owner of Viking Shores who wanted to rehab and the current limitations, for example, he wanted a breakfast cafe. He, you know, he wanted to have a more full scale resort. That's a that's a limitation right now. Um, and, <laughs> and and so, you know, it was that kind of a thing that we didn't. Um, they're all pre-existing non-conforming. We don't see them going anywhere. Um, and and we wanted just to provide an opportunity that if they wanted to do upgrades and improvement, they'd have more flexibility uh, within within mm -hmm. the zone. And this and this was a comment that came out of the charrette too, when we did the day long charrette with the business community, that that was a limitation down there. So relative to transportation, none of them would have new curb cuts because they all have current curb, yeah, curb cuts. Yeah, no, current curb so would, from a traffic perspective, they're not, Adding Ford, Ford says, Ford says a, as a suicidal curb as a cut. suicidal yes. curb cut. I know that would be a few years ago, right? So it's really like, how do we address these pre existing non conforming uses, right? Who want to maintain the businesses and in some way expand them yeah. or adapt some other mm -hmm. accessory use into them? If they stay residential, what's the intensity? Is it just those single family homes or? Um, if it stays as is, yeah, they would be just uh, big default to the standard residential. Or 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 if they're what 30 uh, 3,000 square feet, if they could do duplexes under yes. the uh, they could do duplexes underneath. With an ADO. With an ADO, yeah. I mean, the motel conceivably could utilize the hotel the motel conversion by a lot and, and do more density there right um, you'll get multiple <clears throat> get multiple units multifamily there well and and, and uh, help me be sure i understand this right they're pre-existing non-conforming so if they stay doing the same thing that they're doing now there's no problem the problem only becomes if they want to change to an accessory use or if they want to expand their footprint and apply for so they a, could a double the size, like the chocolate, if the chocolate sparrow wanted to double its size. You could expand the pre-existing non-conforming yeah. use. Okay. And it's we good to talk this through just because um, just to make sure that so, so, so the you could expand yeah, so if the chocolate sparrow wanted to become a bigger restaurant with more tables, it would really have to come to CBA. Yeah, well, and, and anything they do would have to adhere to the regulations. So, you know, that's, like we said before, like everything on these sites are pre existing, non conforming. Right. They don't have the architectural guidelines. They don't, right. the parking's not where it is. Right. They don't have the landscaping. So, every single component of these sites mm -hmm. is going to trigger some level of compliance with, yeah, you want to expand, add on an addition. The addition's going to have to meet the design guidelines, and then you may or may not have to reduce the parking that you already have in the front. You're gonna to have to make up 
right. some ground to bring it more into conformity with it. And that some of these <clears throat> some of these sites are are tight. So if you're not talking about scraping it, starting from scratch, it's always like pushing forward. Mm -hmm. So. Would this be in the category of the other one that we talked about? Maybe not do anything this round and say that there's nothing imminent. That, is there anything imminent? I um, well, I mean, we'd have to check back with the Biking Shores guy because he was he was vocal. Um, we, I wouldn't say it's imminent. I would say this there was a this was um, this was an articulated priority coming out of the charrette okay. that a group of businesses really said we've been limited here. So I'm just trying to be sensitive to the economic development side of it. I mean, I, I think the, I, I guess, Sarah, I don't necessarily see this as, I mean, and certainly our intent by wanting to put it into limited commercial is not to make it widely, you know, developed down here, but sort of recognizing that we have we basically have a strip of commercial properties right, right now that are they're due to be upgraded. They they're due to be upgraded, and we're, we could be hamstringing them quite a bit. I, I you know. Yeah, I think what we're, what we're basically saying is that you guys are all been in business for 40, 50 years without doing anything. We're about to make this property down here easier to develop. Yeah, and we're going to leave you guys in the cold. Yeah, well, that's that property down there is already easier to develop. Right. What's that? I mean, the property down at yeah. the core is already easy to develop, yeah. much easier. It but. is, but we're but it's going to be we're, we're incentivizing it, right? Yeah, and I think I I don't know. I mean, this is a back and forth. We should we should keep going with this, but I didn't think you know limited commercial, you know. I think we've been making steps to be sure that there's a strong differentiation between limited commercial and transitional commercial, so that it really is. I see this as already sort of a limited commercial yeah. strip. <laughs> you know, it's you know, if you just look at that frontage. So well, yeah. I'm in favor of changing it. Just for one that ringer as the as a housing advocate, leaving it the way it is maybe encourages them if they want to do redevelopment to do redevelopment the way they are housing. Because they could do that without us changing. But they couldn't do that. They couldn't do the same density. Right? They couldn't but, do the same density of housing, not under the current zoning. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We want to give them more density. Right, right. I'd love to see it get redeveloped residentially, and you know, have have, have uh, townhouses that's going to be built there. The idea that someone's going to build a house on forty thousand square feet on eight six isn't going to happen. Well, I think, frankly, if if as long as your committee can say that what we really want to have here in the future is X, and changing to that zoning designation is going to facilitate that, yeah. then that would be it. Okay. okay. So we could, so, you know, some of the other, you know, items such as uh, we've top of the shop kind of housing incentives mm -hmm. for workforce housing or back lot housing development that type of thing which is a mix which mix commercial mm -hmm. in, in this the assumption that the commercial is limited it's sort of right i guess i do i do have to say that i'm curious about these residential properties that are adjacent to the taco cafe you know between that and the um the Viking shores and and the real estate office um you know, I wonder whether you re like imagining that once if you designate this whole area as limited commercial, there's a wide range of things that can happen on all of those parcels. Is that really what you want? Or do you really want to allow the existing uses like the Chaco Cafe and Viking Shores and Hoyts to redevelop and do something more mixed use? Um, I don't just think that. Well, we weren't looking to go back beyond to the re residential. Are you asking the question of whether that would be a concern on the residential side? Well, I'm thinking about the properties fronting on Route 6. Yeah, that you've got, starting at the south, you've got the Chocolate Cafe, and then you've got 
with a couple of residential developments yeah. and then you've got a real estate office and a you know in the leather shop which really kind of read like residential because they mm -hmm. have so limited um traffic and and their scale is small uh, and then it, it is really different when you get to biking shores uh, so i just wonder whether you really want to designate all of that and whether since the brick house came up you know, whether if you designate all this is limited commercial, whether all the other pre-existing non-conforming commercial uses on Route 6 aren't going to say, hey, what about us? Like, how come we didn't get switched to? Um, and so it just, you run the risk of possibly uh, recreating the kind of commercial strip developments that okay. That you had before you created this special district right. that you don't really want. But isn't isn't um, the brick house and, and the nursery there already? Uh, this is already. Is it is limited limited yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we do this? Um, it, it, the, we can go to your third point. We're going to come back probably at our next meeting with a whole looking at the underlying zoning document when Paul makes his proposals for things that come out and things that get simplified. Um, and and why don't sort of before before the next meeting, I mean, I keep driving up and down the strip. <laughs> they, they think I'm like, <laughs> like a crazy lady driving up and down the strip, just eyeballing everything. But take a look at take a look at the look and feel and also take a look at the use chart that differentiates between office residential and limited commercial so we can sort of see what the variation there is. And maybe when we come back to that next meeting, we're doing that, we can kind of, you know, have have a little more conversation about this particular one. Um, I think your third point, um, again, this came uh, uh, along the lines with uh, Sarah simplifying some of the tables. Um, I saw the, the example you sent for hyenas, which seemed very, very simple. And, and it was it was almost like, and, and you know, one of the complications with this district is if you're in Main Street in Hyannis, you know, you're in a dense commercial district. You know, we, we've got this, this hybrid thing, which is really spread out. You've got a lot of housing and you've got, you know, it, it's, it, you've got a lot of spread different differentiation here so i and 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 that some of the di differentiation and and you got a trade park you know in it i mean th there's things that are unique so i think some of the specificity we put in there is probably good but looking at the table it yeah it's it's yeah. it's too much i mean although i did say i did count every line and it, we've got five and a half pages and just taking out the things we've xed out we we get down to like three and a half <laughs> we just Yay. take the x out and i said okay I, maybe we're not a one pager but you know is, is there ways of like again when you raised this i looked at it and said okay we've got three different kinds of assisted living assisted living for children elderly you know i mean I'm like right. like right. We don't probably need three lines for that or you know there's a whole bunch of those things so again i think i think i'd like to ask paul to come back with a proposal where we can collapse things and see where we stand you know if we get it down to a good two pager I, we might say okay this yeah. this helps us so this is what you were talking about right this is page eight yes no page six page yeah. six and then this is seven Eight, nine, and then eight, and then eight. Yeah, yeah, it's this. So, yeah. So I was looking at the residential, and then it. Just, oh, that's the one. That's the hyenas example. I'm yeah. Sorry. Right. Yes, yes, the hyenas example. So under residential, it's only multi-unit, two-unit, single-unit, right? Mm -hmm. And we we have much more detail. Well, we have the mixed use. Well, the you top got all these different multi-unit options yeah um you've got cottage court you've got a co-housing cooperative you've got um mixed use and you've got multi-family you know so there's a, a wide range you've got multi-family attached cottage calling and i guess um one possible way to simplify this is to group together some of those multi-family options like 
a cottage court and a co-housing cooperative, which are essentially multiple buildings on one parcel of land, and they're you know designed for residential development. Um, you might not need to differentiate. Like, I mean, are there really places where you would allow a cottage court, but you wouldn't allow a co-housing cooperative? I I guess I'm wondering whether. You know, well, I think I think it goes to. To the districts above, you know, for example, we've we've got proposals that are going to allow certain types of housing at one end of the trade park, for example. That, um, but isn't that just multifamily? I mean, do you really um, need to get into the specifics of the type of arrangement of the? Not necessarily. I mean, and, and this is, I think, where we again, I think I think this can be tightened up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, I think we just. We can just a lot of this stuff can be tightened up and, and consolidated. Mm -hmm. And we need to explain that the use table allows for single family housing in certain areas and multifamily housing. There's all of these different multifamily housing options. They don't need to be itemized. Right. But then that's where you say we have performance standards, which are in the bylaw that says if you're gonna do a cottage core, here's what it should. The performance standards, I think, are something that could go into the design guidelines, the other part of this, but that's where you would say, I'm looking up ESAM, oh yeah, I could do some multifamily, I want to do a cottage court, and they're telling me in the design guidelines, here's how I would, here's what I have to do, the performance right. standards. So I think a lot of this stuff is just too itemized, and, uh, you know, it's just broad category. I think we can, and I think the important things to itemize are the things we want to expressly um, prohibit. I think that's where the detail is useful. You know, so we definitely don't want gas station. We want that in there specifically prohibited, so that way no one can try to you know play a game with. Well, you don't mention it, so it must be okay. Yeah, and, and you know, and we have language about allowing certain things that aren't expressly permitted by special permit, which gives us a little bit of flexibility, but we don't want that to be turned. So that's why it says you can't get a special permit or something that's expressly prohibited. So yeah, we can't list everything under the sun. Someone comes in with some sort of thing that doesn't fit in any mm -hmm. category. They have an opportunity to state their case via special permit and say, this is going to fit in with, you know, but we don't want that. So right. anyway, I'm just repeating myself, but the prohibited pieces where I think we want more, we're gonna use up lines in the use table. I'd rather have it that way. Right. Um, that makes so sense. I guess the feedback, you know, if people are comfortable, we spent so much time on this use table too, that we went through an agonizing detail, but that, but sometimes you have to, you know, walk over the coals to figure out, you know. Yeah, um, because that, that the aggregation, Will be based on that discussion on that deep level. Yeah. Right. So I, aggregate things that are wide, wildly different. Yeah. So I think if everyone in terms of expectation yeah. is comfortable with just simplifying this stuff, mm -hmm. um, we can go through and just kind of make the yeah. stuff that's pretty common sense. We can consolidate this stuff. So as you I look at the table and you say <laughs> RV park and campground below that mobile home home park standard we set is across the same across the board right. when you use the special permit and what's allowed and so forth. We went through the detail before and we came up with what we came up with, but now that we've done the detail, we realize there's an awful lot of similarities between the two of them. So why we spell it out from our level and right. comes in with an RV park or a mobile home park, we know what that's about. So we're not going to look at it differently. Yep. I'll just throw out one other thing and I think it what Paul's suggesting makes sense. But the the tricky thing about housing forms like this um, co-housing cooperative and the cottage court is they're kind of in vogue now. Um, but three years from now there might be a new thing. And so it's you're almost safer dealing with multifamily, you know, attached buildings and, and multifamily mixed use, like those kind of designations rather than naming them this particular type of, right. mm -hmm. you know. The sandwich, that about. tiny house. I mean, who knows what's going to be coming up. Right. Um, and, and what's tiny, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I think they need to be generalized. Mm -hmm. The categories need to be simplified and generalized. I think we're in violent agreement. 
violent agreement. And then, <laughs> yeah. and then that that'll help us go through. Like I said, like do we actually need? I mentioned the performance standards, but do we actually need performance standards for a college? I mean, things that, that you know, that's going to help us pare down the essential stuff for what's in the bylaw and what's in the in the uh, design rates. Okay. All right. So, okay. so the simplification of this document, both in terms of the tables as well as just some of the language that might go into the design regs, um, that'll be on Paul's homework to come back to us with a simplified proposal that we can uh, knock around. For a hundred pages, then what would we feel comfortable with going going to Europe about what? Well, I did because I, I obsess, obsessively counted every. I, I I cut when he said I looked at the performance standards and some of the other language and then made an assumption we could get this down to two. We would we'd be down into the low sixties. Sixties. Yeah. So the other thing, just to keep them obviously the, the document that we've been working with is the markup with all the strikes. Oh, right. so this thing's going to get yeah. yeah the clean version, and I will have a clean version that we can go through. You know it's. It's not as overwhelming as it seems, but even accounting for that, I still think it could be simplified and pared down. And do you think with that, is this my only nagging thing that um, with it simplified, like let's say the example of multifamily, that in the future then, that whoever is is using this as a document to for development, will will know will know what what needs to happen and, and what won't happen. Well, that would be the performance standards. Yeah, outline yeah. different types of housing, and we can make a judgment of how much of the performance standards we yeah. put in the regs. And then the second thing is. Any any category we put up here has to have have a definition in the back of the zoning, so we would have to amend the definitions if we're going to aggregate some various types of housing. We would have to specify that, or again, maybe not every type of housing in the world, but but some way have indicate some the range of yeah. Okay. That's great. That's really good. There was there was one more thing I went when I read this, Sarah. I sort of got the got the sense. That maybe he thought we were sprawling too much. That, that they, I, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just have a hard time thinking of here, here, he sent us a sprawl. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, just, you know, yeah. Sorry. That, um, yeah, that when we talk about from onwards up to up to now, Viking, that that's that's a big area. And does the commission think that we're a little that we're spreading our wings a little too much? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't characterize it as spreading your wings a little too much. I guess what I think we're focusing on is the town was interested in developing a northeast team town center and with a real core that is pedestrian friendly and where there'd be a dense development of commercial uses. And in order to do that, if you have a whole big swath of area, which is a big, you know, that stretch of Route 6 is a long yeah. stretch with a lot of parcels and a lot of acreage. And if you allow a lot of commercial development on all that acreage, it's going to be really hard to convince people to move their businesses into the core because they have just yeah. as good a chance of finding a sort of a financially desirable Lots. parcel outside the core, and you might end up with just properties getting redeveloped as yeah. single use, single access. We never hit critical mass. Right, and you and you would end up with just, you know, a string or a strip of commercial uses along Route 6. They might look pretty. Rather than um, focusing it the way people want to have happen at Kinkle East. So that's why the whole idea about um, defining the greater density in the core area, limiting the de density and development that's allowed in the outlying areas is what's going to allow that core to develop. And then at some point in the future, when it's kind of reached a, a critical mass, 
then maybe you say, okay, well, you know, we don't have enough development potential here and we've got all these other developments that want to happen. That's when maybe you go back and say, okay, well, we need to expand our area where we have this kind of thumb. And that's just, it's one way of looking. Well, I mean, I, I guess the only, the, the, and I, I, I understand. And then I think, I think there's an underlying um, strategy in this that's going to be very important to communicate to the public because yes, it was all approved and this was all discussed in 2017, but no one's going to remember this, that that the notion was to consolidate the density in the core. Um, I think I think the fact that the town controls so much of the land that's in that core is going to allow the town when it issues RSPs to really drive that. So I I, I, I'm a little less concerned. My concern is on the other side is that you've got a lot of commercial activity and it's all pre-existing, non-conforming, and it's all 50, 60, 70 year old buildings. They're all physically going to have to be, something's going to have to be done in the next 10, 15 years. And I just want to be sure the balance of getting the design elements we want with, you know, as something that's economically viable. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting. I've driven by this a million times. I kept thinking about, okay, what will it be like if we, if, you know, how do you incentivize properties to move like to the front with parking in the back? And of course I live around the corner from this and I looked at Arnold's. It, I, next time you drive by Arnold's, the, you know, they have the side parking lot, which everybody sees that theoretically could be in the back. Are. Most of the park is out back. But the building is only like 25 feet from the from the, the yes. roadway. Mm -hmm. And it's right up against, and you've just gone by it a thousand times. So it just feels like the normal. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's really interesting. If I, st I started visualizing the rest of the core, if it started mm -hmm. going like that, I thought that could be really, that could be. And it's really nicely landscaped. It's nicely yeah. landscaping. And it's, it, you know, so. I think. Anyways. Um, you know, limiting limiting the commercial spread and focusing it on the core commercial is, you know, makes sense. I think the other thing, though, is, like, we're trying to make sure that we can allow the residential density in the limited commercial and in the trade part, because this basically all of this Building is open or a prime redevelopment for for some sort of mixed use, but this is and if we max out the town on properties for what we can do residential, that's only a drop in the bucket. So to get the density in the multifamily that we need, it's a hassle. These this is really this is the only place in town. So the the Atlantic Oaks, the RV Park. If the motel units that have acreage in the back redevelop or develop the back lot, possibly the Viking Shores on the other end and in the end of like those are the areas, those are the only areas in town where we're going to ever see multifamily townhouse apartment, multifamily density. So mm -hmm. that's that where we have to that's, that's accommodate true. that in the in the zoning. And then that goes hand in hand with this vision of the connecting roads and taking the pressure off of Route 6. So, I mean, the, the discussion about do we want to limit the commercial activity in these outer areas? But, like, we have to make sure we allow for the density, for the residential density. Right. That's the only place it's going to happen in town. Well, and related to that, I guess one thing I didn't mention that I probably should have is the whole idea of what you allow by right versus what you yeah, allow by yeah. special permit. And right now, I believe that all of your residential multifamily is by special permit only. And you could potentially identify, given that you have very specific dimensional regulations, you could potentially identify some kinds of residential development that are allowed by right, or at least are yeah. easier. I think they did say that. In the yes, yeah. And yeah, like this multifamily attached greater than three units is what we want to happen right. in those areas. And, and so as long as the, the, the uh, 
regulations that are in place that um, are scripted or descriptive of what it needs to be, I think we should encourage more of that. At least in some areas. In right? yeah. It doesn't so have to be a practical. I, yeah. I agree. And again, it's just mm -hmm. you kind of have to walk through the fire or over the coals, whatever I said, and mm -hmm. kind of get to the other side to realize that. Like, I think that's one of the crux of the form based code is that we're trying to tighten up the design regs and the parking and the landscaping so that really, no matter what gets built, it's going to look great, good. So then, why yeah. make someone, you know, but someone wants who wants to do something here is going to say, ah, I can do this multifamily. I don't have to jump through too many hoops as long as I make it look like, like this, this and do the parking. Yeah. And I think we, special permit is always like this kind of safety blanket of make it have a special permit that we got control. Right. And then I think that's a natural reaction when you're kind of doing these big changes. But I think, like I said, now we've kind of gone through and we're on the other side of looking all at this. And it's like, okay, maybe we don't need mm -hmm. as tight a control with special permit for all these things. Well, plus, plus we have the design guide. Right. You know, that, that's the piece right. we didn't have before. Is this the only limited commercial in town that we see in this map? Yes. I, I agree with Sarah. I think if you want to if we want to synthesize people to build then the more dense housing in these areas, make it by right. Okay. What type of housing could get built in any of these areas that people that people would object to? Well, you know, like once you've got the height restrictions and you've got the design guidelines, and what are we what are we protecting ourselves from with the special permit? Oh, I know. Uh, again, I think it's more of a default when you know, and and you know, for example, at one end of the trade park, you're going to have to balance. There's got to be considerations for the balance of the trade park and the balance of the housing, and you know, does a special permit process give you more ability to massage that? I I don't know. And I think what we had done, I got to double check in the table where we talk about density. I think we have some triggers for special permit if it's over a certain density. Right. That's that's where that should be, not across the board, mm -hmm. but based on certain key characteristics, density, size. Okay. Okay, we got it. We get it. We get it. We get to uh, go. There is food in the kitchen. Up to everyone if you want to take a quick break or just eat and eat and talk. But okay, a five minute break. We'll take a five minute break. Do you want to? Do we need to pause this? Yeah. We'll be back in five. If anyone's on. Okay, we're resuming our formal meeting uh, after our short food break. Um, Sarah, one of the other things, um, we had a discussion about teaser parking and I, I you know, we saw your comment there. And I think the two things we were thinking about was one, again, we, we have maintained the prohibition of drive-throughs that was embedded in the original document. So, uh, but so we were not anticipating drive throughs. But one of the things we discussed, but we also heard, is that post COVID, the nature of restaurant businesses have, have shifted in many ways, in the sense that um, uh, takeout has become a very significant part of. Um, business economic business model and and the notion here is without going into drive throughs we had wanted to be sure that in front of building core commercial not in the core commercial but in some of these other longer you know the the edges if restaurants were to come can can you allow that sort of what we call 10 minute pickup parking as a front row um, to facilitate that where, you know, the majority of the parking for folks that are coming and shopping and whatever would be behind. So I think our rationale there was 
uh, we weren't going to significantly, I mean, this is the nature of the businesses anyways. The restaurant industry has changed substantially where takeout is is often half of mm. their business now. So we were trying to rec recognize sort of that economic model that is happening and um, try to accommodate that in a way that was um, not as, as uh, traffic generating, but recognizing that reality. So I think that was some of the rationale. And I just would like you to comment a little bit on the concern that that raises. So for me, the teaser parking issue, it's completely um, an, a community character issue. And I think we've worked so hard in many communities to uh, bring the buildings closer to the road and to remove the parking from in front that the idea of allowing teaser parking in front to me is, is, is a step backward. Um, I think there's no reason why you can't provide parking on the side that provides easy access for people who are doing um, take out food or, or you know, easy access to the front door for anyone really. Um, but putting a big paved area in front of the building, uh, even if it's just one row of parking plus the, the aisle, the travel aisle, I think unless you have a really wide uh, landscape buffer of some sort that you'll be disappointed with the way it works. Uh, I mean, I'm glad to hear that you're not thinking about doing it in the core commercial area. Uh, but I think that, you know, in general, the parcels in your limited commercial and transition commercial are large enough that they should be able to design them in such a way that you have very accessible parking on the side or and to the rear. Uh, I don't think you really need it in the front, uh, but that's, that's my take on it. Any uh, comment? I mean, this was a concept brought to us by Ted. Uh, it <clears throat> made a rational sense in, in, in regards to the business models of restaurants changing so dramatically. Well, the idea, uh, what Mary, something you said triggered my thought about it. Um, if you envision, like in that diagram up there, um, the building on the right is a restaurant, for example. And there's uh, six or seven spaces right butted up against it, not in the front, in the back. And then there's more spaces behind that. If I can see that right. There could be more spaces behind that. If some of those are designated as, you know, 15 minute pickup drop off, that doesn't have to be specified in the regulations. That's something that the owner of the property could just do to facilitate their business model, as opposed to which us. Which they already do, actually. Which uh, some places do. And and even to the point where if it's a new building, and I've been in buildings like this where there's a an exit, an entrance into the restaurant from the back that is just like a little hallway that you walk out and you, you come right to the desk where you can go to pick up yeah. so that it facilitates people getting in and out from the, from the back. Um, so I, I would not be a favorite teaser parking in the front. I don't think for, for everything that sort of Sarah said from the cosmetic front meeting route six. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? No, I think that Caroline should come here. It's a good point that um, often seems that there have been restaurants that have been to the same thing. You've been designated spaces, and unfortunately, you really can't park in front, but I don't think anyone's going to have a problem putting them in the back seat, let's see. I hadn't thought of that. For that. Anyway, a lot of places they have yeah. four or five, six spaces, whatever, depending on the volume they expect. Yeah, I've, I've been to places <laughs> like that too. I didn't think of it because it's just always been there. But yeah, it's back spaces. You go in a back door and you pick up your food that way. So you don't you don't need it. Well, with all the parking in the back, it really sort of begs the question, where is the front door anyways? 
Because yeah. you're not going to have people walking around the building to come in right. the front door. Well, the place I'm thinking of, they have a back door, and then they have just for that pickup, and then there's a little dining area, and people access that from the side. Probably the side. The side the, yeah. Or the, or the front. If it's pedestrian parking kind of thing. I mean, pedestrian. Or so it sounds like the teaser parking is something that probably can go. Come we out. Can, yeah, we don't. So we're not in the board to do it, right? No, we no. don't. Right. The other piece of this is the street side parking, which um, oh, yeah. I just want to run through this. Um, so this would be like not actually on street parking, so obviously not on Route 6, but Bracket on Bracket Road. Road, like if someone wanted to design the site so that they basically had this. Inside their lot line. Yeah, so like this might be the Bill and Jerry's building if they pulled it up closer to Bracket, but then the gray is actually their lot line. This is the street out here on in the white. And if they wanted it to design it so it looked like it was on street parallel parking so they could have they could have that but i guess there's you know, two ways to look at it like you know that is not you know necessarily frowned upon in the core you know when you don't want a street scape and you have on street parking but this is like you wouldn't I guess I just want to make sure, like, if we would do this, is it, does it run afoul of what we're trying to do still? So let's guess the same thing, the teaser part. Is this different somehow or acceptable as opposed to the teaser parking? Parallel. Uh, so I'm just reading it. Yeah. Um, and it would be parallel. parallel. parking looks yeah. like on street parking, but if it were angled parking, then you might feel differently about it. And I think, I guess there's going to be the question of, Traffic safety, doesn't it say somewhere that it has to be a certain distance from an intersection or something like that too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my my thought with this one is you you can't you obviously for reasons you can't do this on Route 6, that leaves us with the stretch of bracket road, potentially the trade park as well. Um I looking at the the lots on bracket road, if you think about all the dimensional requirements, we pull buildings up to the front to have the parking in the rear, but we want these landscape buffers and the sidewalks. I don't see, I don't see the width there that allows a cut in unless they're cutting in from and taking yeah. away from the landscaping or compromising the sidewalk in some way. I mean, I, 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 I'm just not sure this would ever be used. I don't know if it's feasible. Um, and that's my question. It's only, it would only, <clears throat> Real the tra trade pot could also be another place this could cut into. Um, and depending upon how that developed, maybe it maybe it would be valuable too. But well, and if if there was a development sort of being reviewed, you'd also have the fire department want to come in to make sure the if vehicles can swing around. And, and yeah, delivery cool. trucks. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, it, but that'll yeah. happen in the back, right? But they have to be able to get in, right? They have to be able to get in. I, I, <clears throat> yeah. Um. So if we took that out, street set parking by special permit, and somebody came in with a proposal, and they proposed street park, street side parking, it's not otherwise. It's not in six. Yeah. It's in the. I, I think it's area. very. You're right. It's very site specific as to whether that. Would right, but if they yeah. came in by special permit and they designed it that way and it looked good and they had the right landscaping and turns and there's nothing that would preclude the planning board from approving it. Well, this is where. So right now, what we have is there. There is no parking allowed in the front. So your parking has to be to the side or, the or in the rear. Right. Period. So, Period. So okay. if we wanted to do this, then we would be getting into basically some sort of design waiver or something. Because I don't because we don't articulate it like right. prohibit, I mean, you know, a uh, permitted special permit. It's just there is and in which zones is this? The whole district. This is the whole district. 
or is other... this just in the core? I mean, it was it was proposed by Ted in the whole district. But yeah. If you look at the whole district, it's basically Route Six, which is not feasible. And then you've got a, you've got Holmes Road and Racket Road is the only potential place. I'm not sure there's enough depth in those development parcels on Bracket Road that allows everything we talked about. Um, and Holmes Road, I, 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 I don't feel strongly one way or the other. Yeah. But That's okay. and the only place that I could see maybe it happening is if, if the road, if the new road that runs parallel Route 6, if that actually happened and it was a throughway. So connecting between bracket and tea time. Mm -hmm. And if the back side of those lots were residential, like you know, I like could maybe see some on street parking and if that's like a limited access, something like that. But there's a lot of variables and all that stuff. I don't really see it. May maybe on again this other road that might get developed running through running through homes out, depending on how it got laid out, maybe. But now I'm thinking about it. that's probably a scenario where you could probably there would be room to cut in right. kind of like the village at Nasa Green right. where you go through there there's parking mm -hmm. everyone's parked on the street but it's actually all cut into right but wouldn't that be a, that issue be addressed in the design of the new road I'm um, not no and so I guess the other thing to say is we're in this going into the trying to simplify things as we go into the eleventh yeah. hour. So okay. basically, it's if we didn't if we took these two things out, it's basically where we are now. It's just we maintain that it's got to be in the rear or to the side with screening, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's what we have now. On the road then. That's it. I think from a is this pedestrian a point of view, you know, and bicycles and all that, it seems that it's intuitively it just seems like it's going to be safer if you do the parking, like if it's residential, there's parking in the front, if like it's a townhome um, with the sidewalk in front of that, or the parking's in the back. If you If you try and mix those two together, it just feels like yeah, it's accidents waiting to happen. You brought up a good point about housing. So if there's a housing development and somebody wants to have some parking near, out near the front door, they're not allowed to do that now? Well, the proposal is to have the parking in the back, so have like an alleyway and come in in the back. And, and but then you don't have on-street parking. You don't have on-street front it's parking. Allowed, no. And I, and I think all that makes sense for when you're in the core commercial and, and bracket road, but when, when we're looking all the way out to, um, you know, the campground and stuff, we don't know what's going to be built there, right. you know, and having people, I could see people saying, I want to build a town, I want to have a handful of visitor spots out on the curb, so when people come, they're like, oh, there's a one-hour spot, I think, you know, park there. Like, you know, not a, no overnight park and stuff like that, like, you put limitations on all these lots when it comes to residential. I mean, we could we could leave it in Paul with a bunch of limitations or all the deliveries the UPS guy and we're going to block the traffic because they're just going to drop off the package they're not going to go out the back of the residential houses. Well, remember that you can still under current regulations park on the side too. It's not just to the yeah. rear; it's side or rear. So you know, a lot of these developments could easily park, you know, create very convenient <clears throat> side parking. Yeah, I mean, if you think of, yeah, if we did a big multifamily off Holmes Road, <clears throat> you know, the road goes in, but you're going to have area, you'd be you'd cut in, so you'd have some sort of landscape. So you're driving down the new road, there's a landscape berm with a curb cut that you're actually going into your parking that's in front of the building, but it's screened from the street. Like the widget mouse screen, the... the... It, it looks like on street parking, but it's yeah. really cut in off. The it's street. within the development. Yeah, I mean, that's within, within the development, but you could have that, but just picture that only <laughs> the landscaping in front of the. Right. There wasn't room for that, but you could. So I think. 
you know, these are all the things that as I go through, I'm like, there's some good things in here and depending, you know, how you look at it, but it's like, is it essential right, right now? Maybe it's something we grow into if we find that we need it. To me, I want to make sure that the dimensional tables are there, the unit sizes, the incentives for the types of housing we want are there, the architectural stuff is there. And the use table. And, and the use table, so that when, so when someone's looking at this, they say, I get it, okay? Just right. here's the build it like this, and they're telling me what unit sizes, and if I do that, I'm gonna get some perks about extra height. And if I could get extra height, I know I have to have the roof pitches. Like those are the pieces to me that are essential. Right. And as I keep going through, every time I look at this, I'm like, there's some good planning principles in here in general, but is it right for East Ham? And is it just like, do we need it? Mm -hmm. I'd really like to go into the town meeting and just like, here's like the essential core form-based code things that we think are essential that actually help us. And, and the, things forward. the area that <clears throat> we know the least about and but has the most potential for development to go for housing, you know, Alton's Road and, and Atlantic Oaks and all of that. We're designing, we're creating the design guidelines as a separate document so they can be changed. And so two years from now, when whoever owns all that property says, okay, I, I, I want to make some changes, I want to, yeah. you know, so that's a good point. we have time to make some appropriate positive changes to support what then becomes a little bit more known. Right now, it's just, they're just, it, there's not a lot known about what that all could be. We don't know for sure about the new road. We don't know that coming down from homes to connect to six. There's just a lot of what you have said. So, all to your point about what's essential, we're, we're trying to do something in the design guidelines that has either a shelf life of 50 years. Mm -hmm. or a regulation a, that's a two, regulation two, that five. you know can be easily modified as we need as we find out that we need to so should this parking you know you know leave it for commercial designated here in the zoning but then move the parking you know whether you have street parking or not move that into the planning regulations i, I would take it out for now i i think the simplest the, thing. The, um, the 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 planning board guidelines regulations was is where we could have language about if you're gonna do if you're gonna do a development and you want it to have look like you have if you want units in front of your building your townhouse units right. you can do it but you have to have a landscape burn and here's some preferred yeah. alternatives on how to do that. So, so you're could, still buffering. We could part. put that in the regulations, but not embedded in the zoning. Well, it's already in the zoning. I mean, the zoning as is says you got to have in the back or the side, and it's got to be yeah. screened with landscape grid, which is kind of how you address the parking to the side because you yeah. have some landscape in front of your So it's really not changing anything, but in the guidelines we can put in here if you're going to do something like that. Example we said. I agree with that. Okay. Um, so where do where do people stand? Again, I, I'm sort of a little bit with Martin in the sense that I only see this as really practical on Holmes Road. But if Holmes Road got really built out in a with more trades in workforce housing, it could be an essential tool. But it's just on Holmes Road. So that's the only thing I'm thinking about. Yeah. Do we want to put it in here with a lot of performance standards that, I don't know, I go back and forth. I mean, I, I could let it go as well, because I, I think it's going to have limited application, but I don't know. I I, I mean, Kevin, letting it go. Letting it go? Because okay. again, <clears throat> town meeting votes on whatever we end up with here in May, and then 
it's going to be years, literally, before some of this stuff happens. Mm -hmm. There's always the opportunity in the future for any of this. But uh, and in the argument here, trying to make this as simple a document as possible in the time we have in front of us, to me, it's somewhat of a no brainer. It's okay. not worrying about it now. Okay. You know, put it on the shelf for three years from now, four years yeah. from now. Maybe. Yeah, leave it on the list that needs to be considered in uh, next year or year after. So, Holmes Road is still right. There. And if someone, I mean, so maybe seven years from now, someone comes in a development on, on Holmes Road and wants to do something like this, what would prevent that developer from doing this? It's not allowed by zoning. So they'd have to do side or rear. So we'd have to, I mean, not we, <laughs> seven years yeah. from now, won't be with There is not enough pizza in the world. <laughs> um, And is that is that going to stop the development? No, no, it's no. not going to stop the development. Yeah. What can I do? It? I mean, right. we, we're we're trying to insert, incentivize, some zoning, um, some zoning things that, I mean, I I step back and look at Holmes Road and I say if if we've allowed top top of the shop and and some multifamily at the end and we're, and the you know the vision is sort of out there. That's that's just a, those are all concepts right now. There's no like master plan. And although I do, I think we should articulate that building out this roadway and and, and really thinking about the economic development opportunities. I, I had a conversation with Jackie the other day. We just ran into each other in the hallway, and the commission two newsletters ago had a big splash about how, you know we all think about septic re regulations and all the burden that that's going to have. It's also going to create an industry if the entire Cape has to, you know, move to up, upgrade septic. And I thought to myself, you know, Holmes Road, thinking about all of the environmentally related things, the ability to develop, do economic development there. And if in fact, we've given them the ability to also have workforce housing associated with their businesses, could be a real economic gain for the town in terms of property, in terms of jobs, in terms of more people visiting. Um, it, it, it's some portion of the NASA high kids who don't go to college and you want to have viable trades. I mean, so I think there's a lot of potential in Holmes Road that the town would really need to do some economic development analysis and really, and so for our role right now, it's can we give some underlying zoning that might incentivize some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. We can't plan Holmes Road right. from our vantage point right now. That's a, that's a whole other exercise. But I think that point about economic development is, is an important one. Not only the, the it, it, it's it's all the jobs that have been created by the construction itself. And th th that's a point to make in the report, I think. Sure. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. I mean, the. I mean, Ted uses a line in in some of his documents. I don't know if you've picked it up that uh, live, work, and play, mm -hmm. and the notion of that you live adjacent to where you can work and where you can play. I mean, the, the compounding, you know, customers and workers, you know, all within a walking distance. And right. Home Road is certainly would be within walking distance of any of that core commercial. So. Yeah. From an economic point of view, I don't know if this is something that the Cape Cod Commission has, but if you move, if in theory, if you move people from living in Plymouth to living in East Hammer on the Cape, the return on investment in terms of how many times those dollars circulate in the community here versus in Plymouth, there are I've seen, I just can't recall where, but I've seen studies yeah. that describe yeah. that economic boost that happens in terms of how many times those dollars turn over in the community at, at buying gas and, and going to the grocery store and getting a haircut and all those things that happen because you live here versus you live in Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we have stuff like that, but I'm that not sure if we've, to be we've actually done that. There may be something though that 
Yeah, it's similar. Okay. Maybe the economic base mm -hmm. for that movement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So um I think we I think I'm hearing consensus that we should move the parking stuff, defer the T, certainly the teaser and then the on street yeah. in, in the goal of simplification. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of any other major things. There's some details here. Um, I don't think we have to. We have we've talked a little bit around this, so I I think we've got enough feedback, Sarah, that we can um, kind of come in and massage stuff and and you know it, it's it's helpful to hear. And it, it goes back to our report and our rationalization. The changes we want to make, we need to give some justification for why we're making them. Mm -hmm. So any other thoughts before we move on to the design guidelines? Okay. I think I think you all got the revisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen this document. I mean, you've seen a lot of the narrative in this document in multiple places because we had it all in the master document all last year and then then we just separated things out um and every time we go through it there's a few other tweaks so paul do you want to we'll go through the major sections one at a time and you can talk about it people can ask questions or we can talk about any yeah any latest edits uh, yeah so like i said this would be the document that would work hand in hand with the zoning bylaw and <clears throat> um you know, a developer would come in and part of that application process would be demonstrating how they're um, adhering to both the bylaw and the, and the regulations. But um, the, a lot of, a lot of this intro narrative, you know, again, it's just kind of setting the tone for, and we want to make sure that all this language, we're still going through it, but all this language should be you know bolstering the rationale for the uh, for the dcpc why we created it and so and i think for the most part it does just might be able to be edited a little more but um just so all this stuff recycles on itself so uh, in the purpose and intent yep um the one sentence about housing there well it's a question but we are trying to um create seasonal housing as well. And the implication here is year-round housing. But with our definition of seasonal housing as opposed to single week housing, it's it really is workforce housing. So is that kind of assumed in, in the way it's rewritten? No, but we should put that in. It was only it was only listed as workforce housing. We thought that was too limiting. Yes. But seasonal workforce housing um should be in there. Year round in seasonal housing. Year round in seasonal workforce housing. Seasonal work, yeah. <clears throat> and then there was another question I had. I didn't write. There were two. I don't know. They're on the next page. They're not. It's okay. This will be um, what what um, our other consultant Peter is working on as the final drafts of the vision plan maps that we had. So this would be uh, the final version of this, again, showing the cohesive vision for districts and the connectivity with the roadways and things like that. So this graphic would be updated. I, I... If when we get the graphic updated, I, this is just a fun the, in the legend that it talks about proposed road. Since the roads are, um, is certainly where the road comes down in Route Six, is is a little fudgeable right now. I I, I don't know whether Which we should use. You're referring to where Hawks Road comes down to Route Six. Yeah, because you know we've drawn something yeah. there, but the the consultant said, well, it could go the, you know it could go a little bit left or right. Well, it can't go right because it could go through the Sheridan, but you know where it actually comes out. Um, I 
this is a minor point. Instead of saying proposed roads, we might say potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just I don't yeah. I because we're not proposing the roads. This is a visioning and yeah, I and I just it just it's a nuance, but I don't want private business owners to be out there looking at what we're when's the road coming in? I'm ready to <laughs> 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 draw a line through my property. <laughs> so so that's just a little catch. Yeah, I agree with that. It's just potential. And I think this is also really trying to get at these. This is the connectivity. Maybe a road, maybe a walkway, maybe a bike path, and maybe a combination of all these things. But I think we can, uh, yeah, we can well, add a little more this is, nuance. This, this is sort of page one of your community attention uh, flyer. Mm -hmm. That's what people want to see a visual. This is, this is probably the strongest visual. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, 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 I found uh, number five in the further session there. Uh -huh. uh, it, it talks about a broad range of housing choices in at moderate density. I, I don't know what moderate means. Um, if we're thinking about Holmes Road and the multifamily that we want and tea time, I don't know if moderates. There's no definition for moderate, not that we need a definition. I'm, I'm just, I don't know how that could be in the future interpreted. And I, just to a, a, respect a, the a, phrase, a, modern density, the sense still works. I would like to, I, I think the word density deserves to be there somehow. Mm -hmm. Just say increased density or, you know, pursue the causes of life. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Increased but, density. But, but, but you're right, moderate is a... Moderate yeah. implies there's system. high, medium, and low right, kind right. of thing to me. I don't know. Um, yeah, increased density. I did, I did have someone a couple of years ago when we started talking about density and housing say to me, are you trying to do Columbia Point uh, project say, again? Yeah, so and I'm like, no. <laughs> like, nobody in the world would do that again. But, <laughs> but that, you know, but when for some uh -huh. folks... It triggers, they, they trigger large scale public housing is what they think about as dense housing. Yeah, no, we're Beacon Hill. And a similar kind of comment down in number seven, and this is maybe just because of my mindset, but when we talked about, we talked about public accessible, increase in public accessible open spaces. To me, when I see the word open space, I'm thinking, you know, like uh, Sandy Meadow Trail and um, Wiley Park and, and other sort of large open spaces yeah. that so, are so I, I, there. I, I, know I think so. Open spaces, we're looking for some some sort of like a uh, like a, uh, a town space or town square type spaces. Yeah, I think open spaces to me feels like a Real large yeah. block or something. And in fact, it, particularly in the uh, some of these areas were really not trying to create large green open spaces. Yeah. We're trying to create little pocket parks and yeah. little things to have happen. Um, you know, uh, picnic table, maybe parks. Please. You said gathering spaces, right? Yeah, so yeah. Or, so or gathering or, spaces or community spaces. Can you go back to the map again? So the for title to this paragraph that it, it's you the, the title narrative. And, the, and the narrative yeah. public accessible open spaces to to increase that. And I don't think in this area that's the goal. Well, it's it's I would if you think of open spaces as large green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think we have it is the goal that we just said about pocket parks and right. places with some. It, it is a goal. And, agree and this and this here, I mean, one of the things I love about this this thing here is that if this opens, you not only have a development potential for multifamily housing here, but you open up the roadway and you you, you make. I mean, we're thinking of this as really passive oh, pond, the pond yeah. but but there, there there is a big open space yeah. you would now make available yeah. for people. Yeah. Um. I don't I'm know. Okay I with that. It, it, it's just a comment. Okay. And you, you can maybe think about it. Yep. Yeah, no problem.
what do we have? Okay. Moving on. We're on administration, maybe? Yeah. Here yeah. we go. Free application. So we do want to set up a process where we're having preliminary reviews with staff and and the board. So we just make that part of the process so that again, it's facilitating things as smoothly as possible, setting up expectations for what you may or may not be able to do. So we're trying to work that into this. So pre-application review, um, application for development. This, um, I cut this off because Ted had some um, boxes in here about a design review committee, which was a you know, a thought, but we're not really going that direction at this point. So this would be. I'm not sure you even did that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, we probably don't. If you're trying to shorten this, the, 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 yeah. the, the description of what we're going to. I think the diagram helps. Some people vis are more visual learners. Yeah, but not developers. I guess I'm, I'm reading this as a developer. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't need yeah. that. But if you're trying to sell it to the town. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think in 2.1, the last sentence, I think there might be a word missing. And any point in the process, East End Plan Department is available to permit guidance and assistance uh, yes. to provide guidance and assistance. Yeah. I think you mean there. I think I leave the word permit in. I just mean, as I say, provide permit guidance and assistance. Or and this or is a, not, maybe, yeah, no, and this is a change because uh, under the earlier drafts. There was a we strongly encourage people to meet with town staff to review the development. I say, let, no. let's not, you know, this this is you've been doing a big development. Let's just require a meeting so that, you know, people. I mean, what I hear is that people come in sometimes to the planning board. They've spent a ton of money, right. yeah. and sure. then the sure. planning board is kind of adverse to you know, really making strong findings because, you know, someone has said, I've spent $100,000 on architectural designs and they've gone kind of out of bounds. And how do we, you know. Well, and they shouldn't, the first time you see the project, they're showing up with a lawyer and architect. Yes, and, and yeah, exactly. Consultants. So, it, it, you know, so that's 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 the mandatory part of it just to, to avoid problems down the road. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay. So this was language that was in originally. Um, again, well, obviously we struck it just because I think the whole point is if we get the bylaws in here, there really shouldn't be a need for like alternative compliance. And we want you to follow the prescribed design guidelines. So we kind of just. And, and whatever variability we intend should be in the guidelines. Right. Right. I mean, so I, yeah, I agree. I think it just opens the door for people to come in with their own pet ideas oh, and start to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we struck that. Um, general site improvements. Again, this is just. Um, Trying to reinforce what's in the bylaw about compact site development, site layout. <clears throat> so what I've been trying to do is there's still work to be done on some of these graphics and things. I don't I actually just went through the commission <laughs> guidelines, the document, the uh, um, large scale buildings. Large scale buildings. Mm -hmm. I kind of went through that and just picked out the ones that I thought were good cave examples. Um, so some of those we replaced, but some of them I still don't have a good. I think the one on the right would like panic people. Yeah, because I mean, this, <laughs> I know what he's trying to, Ted put these in here, but to me, this just looks like big open parking lots, which we don't want. So, so, so even though he's trying to illustrate like. Right. The, so if I look at the one on the left. Could that be an example of bracket row yeah. six Ben and Jerry's brought all the way yeah. up to Route Six? Yeah. So we would like to see buildings that close to Route Six, which is the sidewalk, the bike lanes, mm -hmm. the trees, 
Well, and the then, landscaping buffer. Oh yeah, the landscaping yeah. buffer. But, yeah. But but that could be an example of exactly of the new Ben and Jerry's at, at Bradford. Exactly. On the ladder. And yeah. and that's that's what my earlier reference to. I I was trying to visualize it, and that's when I drove by Arnold's for the hundredth time. I went, yeah, oh, I, this is this is close is to the road with the. But it's also standalone and mini golf on one side. Yeah, yeah he's got he. But when you start to drive to a whole block. You know, now it's feeling like it feels, yeah, like Wellesley Square or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, like it feels close around. So is that what we want? Is that? I mean, yeah, that was. Me, that feels very. I mean, for the core commercial district, for Crockett Road, that feels fine, and the new road that's it's going to go through. Good. Yeah, but I think I think you're right. There are a number of areas, Paul, where I think you'll be sensitive to. Um, Picture on the right, which looks, looks too large scale yeah. for some of what we're talking about. Yeah. So, I think we've had that discussion oh, yeah, yeah. with Ted before. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize that. But yeah, but the, first, the lower two buildings are okay. I mean, you look at the upper right. Yeah, I know. Be like, like, yeah. Oh, that is a second. Okay. These we were taking out because I don't really know but what they were I'm sure Ted had a vision. I didn't have a chance to talk to him, but I, I just figured if I don't know what this picture is, then we don't need it. So I'd rather not have I don't know what this was trying to do for site circulation, but I'd rather yeah, not have it. Go on the left side and ask you what it's supposed to represent. And you say, I don't know, but it doesn't look neat. So I don't think I was just we weren't gonna have a graphic yeah. for, for this. Like it's necessary. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going through this high level, so we stop if you have specific things you want to go through. Um, and again, just feedback on any of these um, illustrations. I put this one is in the one of the commission documents, which I thought this is actually a senior senior living facility in Chatham, and it has the parking underneath. But the other ones are not. I don't know where they're from. Um, but I get just feedback if you think these are appropriate. Don't look, you know, local enough or, or I and also Sarah, if you know, in your mind, if you got something the commission has, let me know. I'd rather have nice local Cape yeah. examples or possible. But I, yeah. I thought reading through the document for the first time this week that these these sticking you know, they were well connected with the government. So I, I think the lower left is really important to us to think about because when we talk about back lot housing that would be allowed with 39 foot um, roof and the three stories, that's that. I mean, it you know, might not have those balconies, it might not have those dormers, but that's it. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that, I mean, that's going to be an important picture here because yeah. what might be behind the commercial development, you know, if there's depth in the, in the pod, parcel that could theoretically be a back lot building right but the one on the bottom right landscaping screening and shade trees which is an important concept but that parking lot has about 150 parking spaces oh yeah yeah but i'm looking at the centerpiece the idea to say that you know when you're in you're at the outer at the outer break you know that the parking lot could look like this as opposed to just a plant you know, right. yeah open yeah yeah and I like the rear parking in the alley issue, not mm -hmm. that we're developing tea time, but you know, you can conceive yeah. of. Mm -hmm. I, I just know reading it the first time yeah. when I came down and I looked at these four pictures, and I said, Oh, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Yeah. And then I kept moving. So for me, I did yeah. nothing caught my eye. Whereas okay. the previous one, you're right, there was that giant manufacturing. Yeah. There's a Home Depot in that one. Okay. <laughs> just kind of before I forget. I'm sorry. Yeah, that picture on the right, one. you got to kill that one instead. Yeah. Okay. So again, talk about minimizing site access points, internal connections. Yeah, I think I took some, I looked at some commission documents and then the um, Hyannis downtown district had some good images. So I think a couple things came out of that one. This is on the Cape where there's parking underground. 
hundred grand. Um, well, I mean, if you count sort of digging out a basement yeah. and going into it, yes, there are a few. Who um, owns the? Um, oh God, the. Van uh, Cousin. On um, West Road. The. The old cable cut by. No, next to it. Across the, the street. Across the street. Yeah. yeah. Mm. The uh, it's elderly. It's concierge. Oh, Aging rest. I don't know the number, but yeah, that has parking underneath. Yeah, it's probably a basement level. And there's some being built in Woods Hole right now, actually. I just wonder whether ge geology wise, is there a prohibition against underground parking? No. Yeah. It's something that would make You'd it have to have high elevation. elevation but... yeah. okay. No, there are definitely examples. Well, 18 West actually, mm -hmm. it's not below grade. It's just that the under, but it's under right. It's it's right. inside. It, it looks like going inside the building. So, yeah. Paul, is there a downside to having an underground parking residential and somebody want to build it? Cost, cost. Yeah, I mean, it's cost. It's cost yeah. from the town's perspective for them. Um, I don't think so. I don't know. Okay. Um, so yeah, just illustrating some of the concepts we were just talking about, parking placement. Um, again, this just reminds me, so in the bylaw, you know, we do have some language about buffering, buffer standards, and there's a special section. I think we added a little more language into that about specifying buffers to residential, so uh, Bracket landing, Dory Lane is a great example when Town Center Plaza gets redeveloped. We have setbacks that allow the buildings to be close to the road, but also the side and rear setbacks are reduced. But we right. built in some extra language that if you're abutting a residential, it's got to be a little bit further and you need a more of a buffer. A residential building or a residential zone area? If you're doing, if you're buffering a residential development, I think was the language, which okay. is going to so be not, not just the zones. Yeah. Or like Dory Lane, yeah. you're going to a residential zone. Yeah. Could be this. yeah. And the step back too. So again, because we're doing a lot of things, we're letting you go maybe to 35 if you're doing the right combination of uses. But if you're going to do that, you're building, we don't want a 35 foot building 10 feet off overlooking someone's residential backyard. So in the bylaw, and this is reinforcing you got to be back a little bit more vegetation. We also have a your building has to be stepped back. So the first floor might be ten feet. Second floor, the third floor, if you have it, has to be stepped back. You caught my eye. I'll send one on the left. That would have left a little bit of but, well, it, but, it, but it illustrates the point you made in, in the in the uh, urban. Be really appropriate for Florida right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot more than a lot of places. Uh, I guess this will come out actually based on today's discussion. Yeah. So. Okay. Do you want to put a red line through those pollen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you see that number? I'm not sure I know why we struck that. Um, yeah. I don't know why that struck out. Well, I think we wanted to say it wasn't just new developments. We, we were, oh, kind of, right. we were yes, trying to yes. Yes. figure out what what constitutes new development? Because is it you know, you've got minor site plan which gives you like two hundred fifty square feet. So you're doing an outdoor patio. You you don't have to really comply. But anything beyond that, you're complying. So if someone says, well, I'm just I'm just renovating the existing development, we wanted to be sure it, you know, the 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 notion of landscaping and parking and and that does kick in. And in this section, I would say that some of the, the verbiage 
shapes what the term open space means. It doesn't mean yeah. a big swaths of green, yeah, large scale. So this reminds me, just a quick aside, in the bylaw, there's a section that we haven't really talked about, but it's the whole section about the regulatory review thresholds. And I haven't really proposed change anything in there, but this I have brought up in the past, like because everything out there is pre-existing no conforming, mm -hmm. it's how we deal with the, those properties where you're not starting from scratch and a whole new development. How do we deal with these small projects and these little add-ons and these little things? Yeah, like Nickerson said, you just got that whole thing and redevelop Nickerson's garage. And right. And it's then new development. Now we're just putting a few yeah. restaurants. And... Well, in that case, I mean, that that would be easier to deal with because then you have to do everything yeah. per the code. So, but if they were saying we want to add on, we're going to keep this shell of the building, but we, you know, all these. Yeah. So that's not really from scratch. What elements fall under the new development? And then how do we kind of get the push to get more of the develop the part that isn't really new? Like it's this blending of what is required and adhered at XYZ, all soup to nuts, all of the new design versus what do you push on for the rest of the site? And that's been, you know, something I've struggled with the last few years. And so this just reminded me that, you know, it's not new, to, you know, New development is easy, but this what we're going to be dealing with for a lot of this is just this combination of things, and it's just something that there's a lot of I, there's a lot of ugly architecture <laughs> in all the space. Yeah. Well, I, but, let me give you the one example that I, I I was thinking about. We've got these incentives built in that if you you know you can build your commercial property, but if you want to get another five feet in front. And you go to dedicated to workforce rental housing, we'll give you that five feet. Okay. Yeah. And then if you have the space that allows you to, you know, have your commercial development, your parking, and then you and, and some of these lots on Route 6 clearly have depth, you could do back lot housing. And we've proposed a dimension there that says we're going to let you go to 39 feet. You're going to be able to do that three story. Well, I, you know, I started playing the scenarios like, what if the guy at Ben and Jerry's, that strip says, well, I would, I'd like to go up two more stories and add housing, but I'm not going to move the building. You know, like that bonus incentive, you know, we would not want to see almost a 40 foot. I mean, I think that would be really difficult. You know, the, the notion of and embedded in the current DCPC is the notion you have to build the front building first versus the back. So I just think we have to make sure we have these the synced, synced in a way that someone just can't come in and say, I'm going to put two more stories of housing above grind, but I'm going to leave everything else undeveloped in front of it. You know, I mean, that just wouldn't give us, yeah, no, yeah, it wouldn't give us the streetscape, streetscape we want. So we just, there's nuances here again, a sophisticated lawyer can come, you know, if there's any ambiguity here, they can they can yeah. make the case that, oh, you could do this or that, you know, as you as you hear every, every once a month. So where's the trigger? What do we want to make as a trigger? Well, I think the notion is you don't get your back building till you, you do your front building. This notion that, you know, you can't just take the, you can't just, the you don't get the yeah. bonus yeah. and just develop your back building and leave Without that whole, meeting all the other dimensional other dimensional requirements, so I think that was looking at from the open space point. You know, what's going to trigger the requirement to yeah. create these open oh, open space. community spaces? Yeah. Well, we have. I mean, we have a. I mean, I do think because Paul hasn't changed it. I mean, most of it would trigger. I mean, beyond the minor site plan, right now as it stands, any substantial development would trigger all of this. Correct. Um, yeah, it's just when you're doing a pre existing non conforming, like the new piece, the new addition would have to adhere to all the design regs and the height and all that kind of stuff. But there's kind of like a varying degrees of what level of review is, you know, minor, major site plan, or full special permit. And that depends on what you're willing to do to the rest of the site. If you, if you already have some of these things like you 
you don't have parking in the front or you're willing to take that out and move it to the rear as part of the overall, okay, that's great. So you could get away with not having to go maybe to full special permit site plan review. So it's just, because we haven't really talked about it, but it's just something that I would like to go over and maybe at that extra meeting, just how does this all fit together with actually, how do we apply this bylaw when someone comes in? And I'd rather have go through this as a group so that it's good guidance for me. We don't change anything. Doesn't mean we have to change anything, but it's more like, how do we interpret these work, this the meaning of what's in here? And like how, you know, is there any is there any what's the, what's the realm of interpretation of what you could get away with is not the right way, but but when someone comes in with because every every single thing out here is pre existing non conforming. So it's just I mean it's simple to look at someone trying to develop sea time, it's land. This is what we want to build, whatever. Right. But it's yeah. the rest of the existing building, like you say, that people are going to look at the cost of tearing down the existing building and the loss of the tenant income to their own business. If that's what they're talking about, the time to build the new building in front, the cost of building the new building in front, and all this kind of stuff. It's it's a big challenge in that regard. You know, maybe in the end they're going to love their building and be more profitable than ever, but. It's that transition stage is going to be a real time. Yeah. So, and, and remember, in, in the dimensional standard which we took out, the the current zoning has, in order to get your bigger building, you're mandated to build a smaller building up front. I mean, this is not this standard was already sort of thought about, and we we said economically, you have to do like a forty five hundred square foot building here to get like the 7,000 square foot building behind it. And we thought that was too much of a burden for people, but we don't want them to just be able to put 7,000 square feet in the back with a big parking lot. So how do we, how do we massage that? Because we've, we've, we've taken a burden off, but we still want the concept to prevail. And I think one of the things to address in the report, not, not in the here, obviously, but in the report is those those redevelopment economic issues are very real. How does the town find uh, funds to do grants to local businesses who want to redevelop to help them financially? Like those those little um, economic improvement grants that, that that we did that you know just kind of spruce things up, make things look better. That were short term grants and but maybe bigger scale. That would help a business that wants to do that. If ben and Jerry's wanted to move, you know, front side and put housing in the back. That'd be all great. How can we help them yeah. economically? But then the, the distinction is between what's a business versus who's the land. Most of these folks, are, most of these businesses are tenants. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming most of them. I think what's really going to happen is you're going to have someone who's going to come in and say, "Oh, this is a great opportunity. I'm going to develop something here." And Jerry's is going to say, "Oh, I'm going to move over there." Because like the deli's never on Bracket Road is never going to redevelop. Like if they own that building, which I think they do. They do. Because that's a two year, they're going to go out, they're going to have to close down for right. two years. Right. What's really going to happen is someone's going to, it's going to be, capitalism is going to come to play. Someone's going to build something attractive. Ben and Jerry's is going to say, oh, I have foot traffic over here. I'm going to move. And only when that, they lose two or three tenants, they're going to say, oh, it's time for us to redevelop. Maybe. Oh, I know maybe. It's always maybe. But yeah, if you've but, got the space, for instance, the Ben and Jerry's building. If you had the space to pull the new building right up to Bracket Road and keep the existing one functioning while construction is going on, there's no loss of income. But you know, also give up all your parking and, and I don't know how that's going to work. There's not enough space to do that. The construction that. site needs 100 feet around it. Yeah. And a commercial so, site needs even more space. Yeah. So, I mean, so, if you've got the space, you can pull it off, but I don't see that happening. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, I think you make a good point. There's differences between the property owners and the tenants. Yeah. And and if we're trying to, we, we can't manage that. No, we can't manage that. But we can, well, we can also anticipate that the land values are such, you know, a lot of, we still have a lot of families that own these properties up yeah. and down this corridor. And they've been at, they've been at this 40, 50 years. At what point does the next generation say, well, my kids don't want to do this. And we're yeah. going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to sell out. I mean, because it, it, it makes sense. Yeah, like no, so I 
they, I guess they don't own the old property. You just until these properties do just say it's time to go all new development, you know, then then that's easy. It's like just do everything that's in there. But that 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 Ben and Jerry's building, that very end, the little shop that's at the end, the surf shop. I mean, she's a tenant, she doesn't own the property, she doesn't control every anything. And she's just trying to like start this kind of experiment with this small business of hers. She wanted to do like a patio mm -hmm. on the end and have this like little and it's like but they don't have the landscaping, the parking's in the front, the, you know, and so then you just come up to like this, where I struggle with it is like, well, you're, unless you're going to go to special permit, which means you got to go get a surveyor, get this, mm -hmm. spend, you know, so I, I guess it's just always something I'm running up against is like, how much can we realistically force these changes for these smaller projects? And especially when, the owners, the businesses don't control the property and the owner doesn't want to put any investment into it. So like, I'm trying to like tell this person, like you got to figure out, convince somebody to take, reduce the parking in the front, even if it's two spaces, just so I can plausibly say you reduce the parking in the front, which, it, you know, it's just like, I don't just comes into like these little yeah. games that you try to play yeah. just to like which, work, which, work, isn't, to which isn't getting you where you want it's be. not getting us where we want it makes to be honest it makes puts judgment calls on me which i don't like right. i'd rather just say this is it this is it and mm -hmm. to be honest if the if the decision is like this is it it's hard and fast you got to do it all you don't do anything that's easier for me to deal with rather than having these nuances where if you know show me that you're going to do a little bit of this and that it's like i don't i don't like to do that let me help you find a loophole yeah because i yeah. same point i'm because i'm here to enforce the bylaw i'm also here to help you know property owners and business owners get to where they want to go and i guess yeah. yeah so i you know it's just something that i haven't come to terms with how we do it and again it's just it's the pre-existing non-conforming nature of so, so I, I think what will happen here, though, is that if this is passed, <laughs> I think you're going to basically lay the foundation for increased property values along that whole strip, and developers are going to come in friends. and eyeball that and say, hey, because of greater density, blah, 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 I can do this, I can do that, I can do something else. Then you'll start that dialogue with the current yeah. owner, who oh, may oh. have their own business in there and isn't inspired to do anything. Um, but for the right price, it gives the current property owners some future options. You know, I mean, they could say, I'll sell it to you for X dollars if you give me this space to run my business when the construction is done. I mean, there's a lot of the, that kind of trade offs that go on. Um, so that could be the incentive that starts to get this thing moving, too. Um, I We're going to come back to this. We have 20 minutes. So I want to just be, I want to be sure we get to a pass of this whole yep. thing. Do we have a, a separate lighting part of the bylaw? Yep. So I think so. Steve, we should be coordinating. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about these these images. I just one on the left is good. Yeah. yeah. The one on the right, not so much. No. I just don't like that fancy one. No, I mean, we should have a fencing one, but maybe that one isn't the right one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. New Jersey. Chain links like those green plastic things we throw. Oh, God. <clears throat> when we get to this one, so I don't know if we. So five of the six are housing types. And then the bottom one, to my mind, is an ownership type. Because the caption says housing co-op. And I'm just wondering, is there... Yeah, we should probably shouldn't use the word. Well, when we... You might not. When we... 
it's all going to be related when we smush the user table. Right. So maybe we don't call out COA. He was putting all the types that we put oh, in the okay. use table. Yeah. So when we okay when we put that yeah. down, yeah. yeah, got it. What do you call that? Um... Well, if the other one's a small multifamily building, maybe that's a multifamily development. I don't know. Anyway, you you can. Okay. It'll so it'll change. Smush first, picture second. Yeah, right. Smush first, picture second. Yeah. Well, you know, these are not necessarily. I mean, there's so many variations mm -hmm. of right. what these could be. So if you start putting one right. representative example, and that single family dwelling is probably not. That's not what any one's building on here for single family no, dwelling. No. So I would so take them all out. Well, who needs an example of a single family? Right, well, so. right. So I was thinking we might not even need because this is kind of like. I agree. Oh, I do think some visuals will be important. I, I, I you know, we right. put. There's so many variables. Of oh like yeah, yeah. Townhouse. I know. Like we put this in as a townhouse. I mean, there's a thousand ways to design yep. townhouses. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the visuals. Uh, I guess it's. I keep thinking of the five, four or five page. Why that we have to communicate to the town yeah. or for the more pictures the better. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, why don't we come back yeah, to pictures? Yeah, we gotta, we just... gotta keep going, Paul. Oh. Yeah. Well, this mixed use is I mean, we don't allow that many dormers. <laughs> That's a really ugly picture with all those dormers. Yeah. But that would be what a two and a half story would look like, correct? Maybe one up. I know we we put some limitations on how many dormers you could throw up there. We did. Yeah, I guess Is it three? I don't know if there's so much roof space before yeah. the next yeah. dormer. So. Well, but I think you, given that, I believe you have a uh, sort of a line drawing illustration yeah. that shows how much of the yeah. roof can be covered by a dormer, yeah. and that would be much more helpful to yeah. anybody who's trying to figure out what they can build. Right. So we'll come back to yeah. the pictures. Okay. Um, so again, this one was in committee. This is just over in Orleans. Um, I I actually always look at this building because it's just it's commercial. It's got in, it's got um, industrial in the back. It's got different. It's not a metal building, and it's just kind of like something that blends in. I think pretty good for you know, pretty utilitarian design, but it's got some variation. If they just put parking on the side, right? right. Parking's not, yeah, because actually, it's really hard to get in and out of that spot. Because we get, I mean, and and this is a and this could be, you know, um, this retail in the front also could be, I mean, this could constitute a back building at three feet, which would have the housing above right. there as opposed to industrial, and that would be okay, sure, it'd be great. But you don't need to show that. No. If you if you're trying to create space, I don't know what you need these examples. Yeah, those don't go into the. Yeah, so we just don't don't have visuals. Not as many. For yeah, not one. so many. Or maybe not just the yeah the photographs that are just examples of things. I think what you want is a photograph that illustrates a particular thing that you allow rather than a use. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep going. Or you can have design ideas maybe at the end or something like that. I guess the thing is with all of these is just is are the photos adding anything or is it just are we just trying to give one example that's just going to actually lead people off track because it's like so not necessarily excuse me not necessarily saying you have to build this right right so well, see, yeah it's a fine line because like there's certain things you want example because you read the narrative and it's like oh, I don't even know what that is and they can't I can tell you if you see a simple picture like oh yeah it's okay but 
the, yeah. the, the positive feedback I got from the report was the one page where when we're doing the development limits. I said, here's what a 2,000 square foot building looks like. Here's what a 3,000 square foot building. You know, I, I, I did this side by side thing. I, that's what most people commented on. It was like a vid nobody understands what does 3,000 square mm -hmm. feet or 7,000 mm -hmm. square feet look like. And then you show them a visual, it gave them a sense. So I think there's value, but we, we might want to selectively use yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, in our presentations to the various boards and so yeah. forth, you probably don't need this at all. It's so long as you can then show it. You say, okay, yeah. this section here talks about this. Yeah. Here's an example. Probably it doesn't have to be in this document, but during the presentations, it could be examples space, of. You can have something. Yeah. There to see. I, I keep looking at this as a different audience. I'm looking at it sometimes as a, as a member of the public, other times I'm looking at it as a developer. You know, what's the, what's the intended? Target that we're trying to who is the audience we're trying to communicate to? Well, the the guidelines itself would be the regulatory boards and people who want to develop. The report is going to have to give a sense of when we say form based code and we say, you know, yeah. architectural style, we have to put examples of illustrations of not, so you the know, board is what you're envisioning to, you know, what the, what the planning boards will agree or what the general public would read. So that's where we should put a lot of yeah. pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going. And sometimes, you know, one of the things we might need to have, I mean, again, we can go debate the report, is we are asking folks to selectively allow for some height bonuses for certain purposes in certain places. And um, that is, at least in the past, I've, I've sensed that that's a huge sensitivity in the town. You know, I mean, people who don't know zoning can say we give a 30 foot, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, they yeah, they can report, I have a 30 foot height limit. And so when we say 35 and 39, I think it's gonna be important to say what that might look like. And, mm -hmm. you know, we don't think it's gonna be substantial. Here, we I think you know, and maybe maybe the things we need to find images for are those like something like that. I'm not trying to illustrate all these types of development or whatever. It's like this is what we mean with a the 7,000 square foot building as the back lot with some, with a four, how does that look? And then what does the height mm -hmm. difference mean? Not trying to, anyway, it's, it's more very selective yeah. images. The rest is the text that explains like, this is what mm -hmm. we mean. So like this, trying to like, give an example of every type of building type and roof form and development yeah. type no, of townhouse. Mm -hmm. So if you had an example in the lower right, just you said, oh, here's a development that's 28 feet high or below 30 feet. And then at the left, you say, oh, here's the same development at 39 feet. At 39. And people can say, oh, okay. So that I driving by that, I wouldn't really notice the difference. Mm -hmm. But you say, but but the one on the left is going to provide 46 more housing units mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever it is. I think it's how you sell it. Because that picture on the upper left is a very attractive picture. It doesn't look out of scale to me, but it's obviously it's jam packed with resources. Mm -hmm. But it's somewhat mm -hmm. efficient. Right. Those are but those dormers. That was someone we talked about in INS. Right. So actually, our, yeah, that one can't. We can't. We, can, we should use that work. picture because the dormers are big. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So structures, roof forms. Again, I mean, we have a graphic in the bylaw that basically mm -hmm. says, yeah. you know, in, a, in, a, mm -hmm. in an illustration what the roof forms are. So, sign guidelines. What are the lot limits? What are the monuments on those people? And we have, and we actually have another section. There is a sign, because I was really concerned about, and I don't know how. Oh, I would use as an example, um, what's the name? The Cedar, Cedar Bank sign. 
and that's the first sign of well, that's the other thing I would say. If, if you find examples that are local that people know, yeah, well, you, yeah. you should yeah. use multiple yeah. things. But well, so there's the question comes to that, though. What's that? There's supposed to come to that because there's a group of people that really don't like to banks, and so just having <laughs> um, the triggers. No, I can't help people being triggered, but okay. um, <laughs> but the idea that someone says like you know like oh here's a you know any just any local yeah. example is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I won't use the name. Okay. The pictures. Okay. Taking out the pictures is going to cut a lot of space. And you know, if you feel like you want graphics, you could just pick like some of your favorite graphics to be at the beginning of each section, like at the beginning of the yeah. science section. Maybe you have a couple of pictures yeah. of your favorite yeah. science yeah. examples or something like that. Yeah. And I asked you, Paul, the other day. This this has some performance standards, but it also relates back to the signage code for East Ham, which has. 10 foot, did you tell me it was 10 foot height limitations? Okay, so my question is, how did like, did Cumberland Farms with their big, uh, you know, uh, how much gas costs sign, it was that a variance that they got? Or how, how did they get that if we have a 10 foot limit? Is it pre-existing pre pre non-conforming so you can replace, you can replace Oh, they had, the there existing. was a gas station for the, before that. Keep the same dimensions if you're okay. reusing the. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Same uh, thing like um, the one, the rest, uh, what is it? What is it now? Main Street Market? Casa del Cabo. Yeah. 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 But That's do what we, it is now. I do think we want that is bigger than you'd be able to, but they yeah. just keep reusing the same. Yeah. Like the lost dog sign. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's nothing we can do about that? I yeah. mean, we could, we could change the sign. We'd have to adjust the sign by a lot separately. No, we could adjust it here because we, we could adjust it here just for the DCPC because there's a this is where we're dealing with Carolyn on, on some of the other language. If there's a conflict between one bylaw and this bylaw, this bylaw prevails. So if we wanted to say any replacement sign must conform. To a new height limit, we could do that here. I like that. I, I, I would. Are there any other tall signs up there? Well, you, you, the gas stations are all of them. Uh, Casa del Cabo, but that's you know, uh, East Ham Superette doesn't they have a big sign? Oh, I mean, Nickerson's is probably more, more way more than ten feet. Um, miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Let's, we can, oh, like that. That's we can put that, we can put that sign that we can put that concept mm -hmm. there. All right. We get so two minutes. I think, um, what we wanted, what we were talking about also was to take the performance standards out of the bylaw, put them into the, put them into this right. document. Right. Um, and it's one other thing that we talked about yesterday. Um, street activation realm. Oh, the complete streets. Complete streets. Yeah. Can, can so, you go back to that? It, or that's in the planning document coming up. Yeah. So the complete streets part was something I felt was overkill. To put into the bylaw, especially where Route Six, actually point Mary made was Route Six. We don't control trying to put complete street standards for an area where we don't even have any control over. Ultimately, that was like a big piece of it. But again, it just also seemed like just in general, just like one of those things that like may maybe in time we want to add some stuff back into it if we feel like these other roadway connections are happening. We can add these things more easily into a planning board reg, but again, just trying to create the simplest document we can to start off. Like that to me just felt like it was just like a lot, there's a lot of verbiage in there. There's a lot of stuff that just seems like overwhelming at this point. And so my thought was to just 
take that out of the take that out of the bylaw. And then it's some of the stuff is repeated in the design guidelines. So first we thought put it all in the design guidelines. Then we thought, do we even need any of this stuff at this point? When I read through this, I felt it was somewhat repetitive. I was reading through the same the first time I saw the same. So we've, we've, we've gone through a lot of this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I looked at the, when Paul, you know, raised to me the issue of it being too complicated, I went back and I sort of read this trying to get eyes for like the first time. And, and it hit me. I said, this complete street guideline, like 90% of this district is on Route 6. None of this applies. Okay, we don't control the street. We can't mandate sidewalks, trees, any big thing. We can't mandate any of it for 90%. Then I said, okay, there's Bracket Road and Holmes Road. But even if you look at Bracket Road, the depth of those properties aren't that substantial. Um, and the notion that we want to have a lot of things happening there, we, we don't have the roadway depth to add all those amenities. So. I guess the road I was always thinking of is the, is the proposed road that goes, ones. you yeah. know, from bracket to what the road is from bracket to two times. And, and, and I mean, road. and that could, I mean, it, again, that could, that was a debate. Do we have these standards in e and even limit them to a couple roadways we think they may be appropriate? I mean, yeah. I felt it, we would look silly going out with this con complete street thing and saying, well, it's only going to be this little piece and this little piece that it's even feasible. This looks very urban to me, too, I have to admit. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it's the right yeah. ratio for you know, a new road constructed in North. Yes. Well, there, there wouldn't be any room left for the building. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I mean, I think if something like this is happening, it's a major project that is going through special permit review with a regulatory board. And that's where it, it kind of gets hammered out, like right. as part of the site, overall site development. Like someone wants to do some sort of amenity or they want to build out a sidewalk or whatever. I think that's just, again, for now. A patio in front. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, it's more manageable to incorporate that as we're going to handle that in site plan review than trying to put this whole thing in. Okay. Again, we may grow into this later, realize we need it, but for now. Well, I, I, and I, I think what Mary is maybe trying to say, well, I don't know, what I'm trying to say is, I don't think that's aspirational, appropriately aspirational for most of the area, particularly in the Fort Commercial, because it, it is too urban, it's too, it's too wide. Yeah. I mean, I forget what the numbers when you add up those dimensions are, but I remember thinking before, that's that's so big mm -hmm. that that's not what we're trying to create. We're trying to create buildings up appropriately close. Yeah. Like, you could almost, yeah. almost say Ben and Jerry's still in the same spot. Yeah, yeah. Right. Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> so we, have, really we would just <laughs> eliminate the pocket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Caroline's would be in the same spot. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 No. Okay. So again, this section would come out and then it would also come out in the bylaw again, just trying to get Going this to down to yeah. simplify. We've had, a, we've had a lot of debates with Ted about some of these topics and 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 I don't debate his expertise. I, um, I think what we kept trying to impress upon him and because and, he's, he's, he's done this in many other business districts but I said, out in the middle of the Atlantic here. But yeah. with a four lane highway, I mean, yeah. it's the four lane highway that makes this unlike any other walking business district. I mean, it's it, it is whatever. Okay, what else do we? Um, think, most of these are pictures, the balance of this. Oh, yeah, the street we just talked about the public realm. Okay, yeah. I would suggest um, giving a temporary placeholder. We all keep referring to, and maybe it's just me. The road from bracket to tea time and we, if that's the name the road from bracket we should give it some sort of a you know when you try to sell this to the public you um, want to say well this future this is the, whatever, don't give it a name the, but it's in the picture it yeah. no we, we should call it something like in i remember we did the it's central called, lottery it was called the hall road you know or it was that, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. the name when we central, call, street. central street or yeah or, yeah yeah call it something aspirational aspirational yeah 
right. We'll, we'll all think about that. It's yeah. the homework for the next one. What's the expiration of that? Selling it. That, yeah. It's a, yeah. Not, oh, so you're going to clean up Route Six, and now I get to walk along Route Six to get an ice cream and you know walk. I know I'm definitely yeah. I'm not so in favor of that. But if we start talking about this aspirational road. Yeah. I think all these properties. Pleasant Street. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasant. <laughs> So, you know, the first um, picture in the front, the map, I think it should be bigger. Yeah. So, yeah, we can. Yeah. It's, and in the report, I'm sort of envisioning that maybe we could do it as a spread. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. cut it myself to make it a page so I can. And is there a report check? Oh, is that just what you're referring to? Oh, no, in, in my head. Yeah, that's, in my, that's, 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 that's just in my head. Like no, 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 I've been. Because it looks like just you wait, wait just now. Just you wait. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, I'll, I appreciate the feedback. Again, I'm just going to try to work at refining these two documents, simplifying them. I think less is more in most of these sections. And just that's kind of what... My mindset is with this, you know, good before we adjourn, I don't know if people have calendars with them. Yep. And if we look out to, because we are meeting on November 17th, 19th. But if we look out um, two weeks from now, the week of October 28th, Friday is the first. Um, I'm not out of town that week. You're out of town that week. Okay. I could be on Zoom, but you could I'd rather be here the first week in November. The first week in that's fine. We could do the first week in November because actually the way yeah the way the schedule falls, we still have two weeks before the next one. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, election Tuesday's day. election day. Um, and I, I know. Some people have conflicts. Well, I know there's planning board and ZBA and other things. Is is that that week, Paul? Uh, ZBA would be the seventh. ZBA would be the seventh. If there is one. And planning board. Planning board would be the twentieth, which also happens to be Thanksgiving. So I'm not sure if they yeah, they want. Yeah, they postpone it. Wait, is it Thanksgiving? No, Thanksgiving. it's, it's the Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's the next week. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a very late oh, this year. The twentieth. Okay. Yeah. How about um, Wednesday the sixth. How does that look for people? Wednesday. Like I think that's fine. And okay. and mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, I know you you've been very good about. Well, I'm hunkering down in my basement on Wednesday, on the sixth. You're in your basement on the sixth. Okay, well, hold on the sixth for those who dare come out. Right? Which, which day? Wednesday, November sixth. It's the day after the election. Your day after the election. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll bring liquor to them. Yeah. <laughs> <We're> just joking. <laughs> no, they won't. They won't pay. No, we'll be on pins and needles. Can you do that? Uh, Stacy, yeah. do this. Yeah, I can. Stacy can do cover CPA for me. Is there space? Will there be space? Uh, it won't be let still me just taken. Make sure it's something else not for. Take a look. And does this work for people four to seven? Yeah. yeah okay, nice. generally. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Human Services Committee has already booked the room at 630. So we'd have to meet if the library is open or worst case go over at the police department. Do they have they book both rooms? CPA is next oh, door at five, and then someone has this meeting, this room at six thirty. So we would have to check the library or police. Or if what if we went three thirty to six thirty? Six thirty. Does that work for folks on the sixth? Does that get you out a little earlier? Three thirty to six thirty on the sixth, and we and we'll have to be efficient because someone will be coming in. Okay, 3.30 to 6.30, task force. Okay. And and hopefully we will have, I mean, we'll have a bunch of things by then. What we can get, to, we'll have an ADU revision. We will have integrated 
whatever comments Carolyn makes legally that we need to do uh, in all of these things we've talked about in and out. Or we'll do the basic zoning bylaw and make sure we've got that in good shape. Okay. And then the issue Paul raised about how to- Pre-existing non Yeah. How to deal with that. And the regulatory, can I go through the mixed use table again? Yep. I mean, not mixed use, use table, the dimensions table. Well, I'm wondering. I'm hoping that Paul can putting it on Paul, as opposed to us trying to do it physically. He can come. He can come with his proposal, and then we can we can have the old document, the new document, and go back and forth and adjust it there. Okay. Um, any other business that people need to bring forth? Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, I'm going to. Uh, Call for a vote to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you all. Have a good evening.